Good evening. I now call to order the work session of the Board of Education of Baltimore County Public Schools. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Norma Sorto from Towson University. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our next item is consideration of the agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Ms. Jones? Yes. I would like to add to the agenda um, the voting for um, the May Distinguished uh, Awards uh, after the selection of speakers. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Would you like to speak to your motion? Um, yes. So every other year, MAPE, the Maryland Association of um, Board of Education, nominates distinguished members of the Board of Education along in Maryland. And this year, I would like to nominate on behalf of Baltimore County Board of Education, posthumously, Mr. Roger Hayden. Um, we'll have to take a vote to send that nomination to me. Thank you. In accordance with board policy 8314, there needs to be a majority vote of the board to add or remove an item from the agenda. All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. The revised agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Our second speaker is Diana Bergman. Our third speaker is Dr. Laurie Taylor Mitchell. Our fourth speaker is Allie Perlman Sachs. Our sixth speaker is Laura Holieris. Our seventh speaker is Amanda Holter Eisenhart. Our eighth speaker is Amanda Wolf. Our ninth speaker is Tia Knott. And our final speaker is Amy Lamb. Thank you. Our next item of business is new business personnel matters, and for that we call on Ms. Maria Lowry. Good evening. Excuse me, Ms. Lowry. We uh, added an agenda item just ahead of you, so we're going to take care of that. 
Not a problem. So we're now going to address the agenda item that Ms. Joes uh, added and that we approved adding to the agenda. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Causey. And uh, thank you, Ms. Lowry. Uh, I would like to nominate from the Baltimore County Board of Education, Mr. Roger Hayden to the May 2020 Distinguished Board Member Award. S Is there a second? Second. Again. Thank you. Would you like to speak to your motion additionally? No. No. Mr. Roger Hayden's accomplishments are pretty well known. Um, I'm going to get emotional if I do, so I'm going to write it up. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. She had a discussion. Would you like to say a point, Ms. Pester? Uh, just that um, well before the May statement came out, I spoke to Mrs. Hayden and we talked about all of the things that, um, <laughs> okay, no. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And now Ms. Lowry will invite you up. <coughs> Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, <clears throat> Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, <coughs> and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, <clears throat> deceased, recognition of service, and consideration of the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council appointment. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E4? Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Do I have a second? Thank you. Is there any discussion? I do just want to point out this evening in our deceased recognition of service that the board gratefully acknowledges the services of Ms. Shari Lawn, Manager, Project Management Office from the Department of Information Technology, who served Baltimore County Public Schools for over 11 years. All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that we call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Senior Operations Supervisor, Plumbing Services, and the Office of Facilities Support, Specialist in the Office of World Languages and Supervisor Teaching and Learning in the Office of Special Education. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Our first candidate is Jeremy Mason. Senior Operations Supervisor in Plumbing and Services, please stand. He He brings five, over five years of service in Baltimore County. His previous job was the field representative in Plumbing in the Office of Facilities Support Services. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Ashley McCarthy and the specialist in the Office of World Languages. Please stand. She brings six, over six years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, prior to this position, she's the resource teacher in the Office of World Languages. And prior to that, she was a Spanish teacher in Franklin Middle School. Supporting her tonight are the following individuals. Please stand. Her husband, Matt McCarthy, Director of Office of World Languages, Jennifer Hernandez, Co Coordinator of Office of World Languages, Kim Shinazaki. Supervisor of Office of World Languages, Jody Grozer. Resource teacher in the Office of World Languages, Stephanie Gerhold. And resource teacher in the Office of World Languages, Caroline Lubin. Congratulations. Yeah.
And we have Dr. Jason Miller, Supervisor, Teaching and Learning in the Office of Special Education, Teaching and Learning. Please stand. <laughs> Prior to this appointment, he was the supervisor of special ed in Calvert County Public Schools. He was the department chair of special ed in Anne Arundel County Public Schools and served as a math teacher, special ed, and alternative education teacher. Congratulations. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business board policies. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policies. Policy 5510, Positive Behavior. Policy 5520, Student Dress Code. Policy 5530, Student Use and Possession of Tobacco Products. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit G. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you, the motion carries. The next item under policies is at its meeting on February 3rd, 2020, the Policy Review Committee voted to move Policy 2380, Records Information Management, forward without a recommendation. The policy is a new policy and the Policy Review Committee felt that we should bring it to the full board for its consideration before we move it to a uh, second reader. Do I have a motion to accept the new board policy 2380, Records Information Management? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Actually, discussion? Discussion, yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, since this is the first time it's come to the board, I would like to discuss this um, further before moving it to the first reader. So I do have some questions for staff and the PRC committee. Um, on the fiscal impacts of this, if you could explain this policy, where it stemmed from, why the need for this policy, and the fiscal impacts of this policy on the system. So, Ms. Howie, who is our staff liaison, is not here this evening, um, but if you would like to submit those questions, one of the options under the uh, the policy about developing policies is that we can take a policy from a first reader back to policy review committee and have it further reviewed, have it further evaluated. But we did want to have this opportunity because it is a brand new policy um, to bring it to the, to the full board first. So um, thank you for your questions. Are there other questions, comments? Ms. Rowe? So I just wanted to say, uh, Ms. Joes, you will find I think a lot of the answers to your question in the analysis, there's a fiscal impact note there. Um, and we discussed a large portion of what you're asking questions about in the policy review committee where we looked at this. So um, we can pull it out a second reader, but in, if you find things that you want. Um, my concern is that the PRC committee did not vote on this. They sent it directly to the full board. And um, that kind of puts us in without you guys having done a thorough review. So I really would like to move to send this back to the PRC and answer some of those questions that I have. Um, get some time to review that policy, get answers from Ms. Howie as well. Um, so I move that this policy goes back to the PRC committee for further review. Well, we have a motion on the floor with a second, Sorry, yes. so we can um, dispose of that motion. But first, I want to see if there's other questions or comments from board members. Ms. Hen. Um, so 2380 is a policy that I've taken an interest in, even though I don't serve on the review committee. It's one that I've studied and have studied the recommendations, both by staff, by watching the committee meeting, as well as I've um, reviewed the fiscal recommendations, because there are some um, fiscal concerns that I have, Ms. Joes, so I wanted to look at those carefully. Um, the policy is in alignment with the EMERGE recommendations, which was the um, study that Dr. Williams had 
ordered following the concerns around document retention. So this policy came as a result of um, the concerns around document retention and is consistent with both other local boards of education policies um, that were reviewed by staff, as well as it's consistent with the eMERGE recommendations. So I am in support of 2380 as revised by staff based on the PRC's feedback. And this is the policy that's before us is the second version of a policy that has come before the PRC twice. It's been discussed extensively in the PRC. And, and I'm noticing that Ms. Howie is now um, with us but I, I would like to finish my comments to address your concerns. And that is I'm in support of this policy in, for two reasons. One, that it is consistent with the iMERGE recommendations that were made as a result of Dr. Williams' um, consultation that he ordered. And the fiscal um, impact of this is addressed in the document that Ms. Rowe mentioned. So that information is available in the video of the, the committee meetings. It's been discussed in PRC twice now. So I, I have reviewed the emerge report that did come in front of the full, full board. My question is, is um, to Dr. Williams or to Ms. Howie, um, do we have somebody that is maintaining these records? Because this seems like it's a new full-time position that the board wants to add. Is that correct uh, yeah, for gonna, records management? Gonna, we are going to welcome Ms. Howie to the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Good Howie. Evening. Sure. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, Ms. Jones, there is not currently a records information management professional who is on staff in the school system? No. So is that something the system and Dr. Williams, is that something you recommend? Uh, is that, because I really want to know from the system um, what your recommendations are um, based on the iMERGE report. So I'm, I have reviewed the eMERGE report and I do support the recommendations. Um, I do appreciate your question about furthering looking at this policy to make sure we're answering the questions and they are aligned with the recommendations from eMERGE. To um, be very specific, I do support looking at additional support within record retention. So is it possible to identify somebody within the system without a fiscal, um, sorry, to identify somebody within the system that's currently doing work that's similar to take that position on uh, for records and management? So as we reported in January, we gave an update about some upgrades to our process. Um, even though eMERGE recommends, I did not include that in our budget. It would just cause us to look at our, our budget and trying to figure out how we can uh, support additional body. Right now, I, I'm confident in what um, Ms. Howie and team had done to create some processes to improve the process around record retention, since that was a, a big topic. Um, but in line with the eMERGE, it does say a particular person. Um, I don't know who's out there and who has that skill set uh, to actually do the work but it's worth exploring at this time. But I think um, we will probably have to talk more about where that would be and how quickly we could hire someone. So would that person be under your, in your cabinet and under you or under the board? It would be under Dr. Williams' staff. And who would hire this professional? Um, well, those are the particulars that we would have to So it out. looks like it's not ironed out, which is why I'd like to send this back to um, back to PRC for some more of those ironing out of those details, which is critical because this is the first time the board is it's coming to us. So as it stands now, I'm, I'm going to um, vote no to send it back to PRC for some of those questions answered, how we could iron out those details. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Joe, some of those details, I think, are straying outside of our lane as a board and are within the superintendent's jurisdiction um, and are defined in the rule. So if we were to implement policy 2380, then the, uh, the um, rule 2380 would then define what those details are, and that would be up to Dr. Williams to decide that. And in regards to your comment about this 
this particular position, um, unless otherwise stated, that position would be up to the superintendent to hire because, as you know, the superintendent hires all staff within the system with the exception of um, very few positions which report directly to the board. I understand so that. Those Ms. details. Hen. Excuse me, I still have the floor. Um, so you're rambling about things Ms. that Jose, I already know about. Excuse, excuse me, Ms. that's Jose, a personal we'll, insult we'll that I take offense time. to, Ms. Joes, and I still have the floor. My comment is such, I'm responding directly. You, I gave you the attention when you had the floor. I asked for the same professional courtesy. My comment is directly in response to your concern that this position would report to the board. It would report to Dr. Williams, and those details would be up to Dr. Williams to determine when he adjusts the Rule 2380 in response to this policy once adopted. Those details are his job to determine, not ours. Thank you. Ms. Joes, did you have another comment? No, I'm going to vote no on it. I would like to go back to policy, to PRC. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, other questions or comments? And I do just want to remind the board that this is not approving the final policy. This is the board approving it to uh, move from first reader to second reader. So all in favor of moving the policy forward uh, for first reader, from first reader to second reader, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. That motion does not carry. Board members, is there another motion to entertain? Ms. Joes? I move that this policy go back to PRC for further review. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? One abstention? The motion carries and it will go back to policy review. Thank you. Now the next item on the agenda is public comment and this is one of the opportunities that the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members in hard copy through our staff or via email at boe at bcps.org. I now call on our stakeholder groups. And our first one is Ashley Kane from the Baltimore County Student Council, Superintendent Student Advisory Council. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairman Causey, Smob Omar, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. I'm Ashley Kane here on behalf of Angela Chin, the President of Baltimore County Student Councils. In past statements, we've spoken about the importance of cultivating a kind environment in our schools. However, as tonight is the last budget meeting, I'd like to reiterate the importance of not just altering our attitudes, but making mental health support for students something systematic. From allowing students to ask to access school psychologists, to adding mental health to curriculums, BCPS should be doing everything it can to be putting students' mental health first. This even encompasses raising teachers, social worker, and counselor salaries and treating them well so they are freer to develop trusting individual relationships with students. These relationships matter a lot. It really impacts students' experience and performance. Students feel well supported when their educators are valued by their school system. After all, students are around these adults for eight hours a day. 
This emphasis on mental health support in all dimensions, including teacher-student relationships, is something that will continue to advocate through BCSE and as students of BCPS. Additionally, in BCSE news, today students participated in Lobby Day. Students from across the county traveled to the state capitol in Annapolis to experience the legislative process and advocate for education-related bills. Throughout tonight, I just urge you all to remember the decisions you make must serve the students of this county. Our futures depend on our education and educators. I urge you as board members for Baltimore County Public Schools to put students first. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next public speaker is President of TABCO, Ms. Cindy Sexton. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As you know, educator retention has been a hot topic of mine, and I've shared the data with anyone who will listen, and many people who really didn't want to, but I shared it anyway. Because I don't know when we call the educator retention concern a crisis, but it is a crisis. We need to be looking at the data right now and start working to stop the exodus, right now. Not next quarter, not over the summer, not next year now. The problem isn't that there aren't enough people out there who can do the job. Because there isn't a teacher shortage, there are plenty of people. The problem is they don't want to do it. And a professional pay is only part of the problem. And of course, there are always those budget constraints. But there are plenty of other things we can do right now to retain our educators. And I'm going to mention two of those factors tonight. Workload. Let's look right now at all that is being asked of our educators. I don't have time in my three minutes to list all the things required on a daily basis. And don't let me get started on the requirements for our special educators who are literally doing two jobs. What is truly important and must be done if you want the educators to stay, their workload must be lightened to what is truly important. And how do we know what that is? Ask the educators. The second thing we can fix right now is support. Many of our newest educators do have a consulting teacher, and that is a wonderful program that BCPS has. But we don't have enough consulting teachers to meet the demand created by the number of our new educators each year. We need everyone who can to go in and actually support and guide our new educators. Daily, truly daily, I hear from first, second, and third year teachers who are receiving ineffectives on their observations, yet not getting the support they need to develop effectively, other than from their CT. Certainly, it is not happening in every school, but there are pockets where it is happening extensively. Wouldn't it be better to work with these new educators and help them develop? Of course it would. Can we please put the word out that that is the expectation? So there are many other topics, but these are two we can start to fix right now. Poll after poll and research data after research data, the information is out there to tell us what must be done to retain our educators. But we, it's also in every single one of our schools. The educators know what we need. If we show them that we are working together to address these concerns and then take some immediate steps to fix them, we can start to retain our educators, which is what our students deserve. Our kids can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Tom DeHart, Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees Executive Director. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. Team BCPS. Any organization can call itself a team but to create a winning team, all components of the team must feel valued and respected. Every winning World Series or Super Bowl team will talk about the cohesion and support felt in the clubhouse from all aspects of the team, from the front office to the manager and to every player. At the last board meeting, you passed an amendment to the bu budget calling for a 15-minute extension to the school day, a move that you knew would be a significant cost. TABCO negotiated a one point, uh, I'm sorry, 
TABCO ne negotiated a 2% salary increase to fund that extension. And while not negotiable, the paraeducators salaries would increase by just over a million dollars. Case offered to accept the 2% increase negotiated by TABCO for its school-based members, that is our principals and assistant principals, whose work days would be increased as well. We were told that no money was budgeted for us, but we were offered a one-time $1,000 stipend instead. Really? Enough already. We talk nonstop about equity, but do we practice what we preach? This is not about equity. This is about discrimination. Let me give you an example. Each of you board members is given a $7,500 stipend for your service to the system. What if you were told that the women on the board would only receive $1,000 because of fiscal issues, but the men would receive $7,500? Would that be acceptable? There's absolutely no difference between this scenario and what's being proposed for school-based administrators. Now, I've sent each of you almost four pages of testimony of the rationale for why principals and assistant principals should receive the same compensation as teachers for the extended day. The bottom line is that their day is being extended as well. Not to compensate them is not only unfair, it's wrong, and it's discriminatory. Case is asking the board to move and approve the same 2% salary adjustment for school-based administrators as they do for teachers. Team BCPS has some real issues in the clubhouse. This board has the opportunity tonight to address one of those issues on the surface, but candidly, much must be done in a more long-term way to value and respect all the players on the team. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is from Baltimore County Public School Organization of Professional Employees, Mr. Nick Argyros. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and board members. I return this evening to highlight the compensation issues that need to be addressed with the OPE bargaining unit. Those issues include adding steps to the OPE salary scale, longevity steps, and a stipend for work-related degree attainment, all of which require minimum cost to the system. Adding the salary scale steps and longevity steps would also address equity issues. We requested three additional steps to be added to the OPE salary scales to compensate OPE employees who have reached the top of their pay scale. The talents and expertise these individuals provide to the system are invaluable, and adding the steps would align OPE more closely to the 30 salary scale steps afforded to TAPCO. The additional cost for these steps amount to $120,000, which is less than one-tenth of the 1% 1 of the total proposed school system budget for 21. We requested the addition of longevity, the addition of longevity steps every two years beyond the last step of the OPE salary scale. Adding the longevity steps would align OPE more with the longevity steps provided to AFSME and ESBBC. We also requested a $2,000 stipend to OPE represented employees who attain a work-related bachelor's, master's, or doctor's degree. The additional salary uh, scale steps, the calculation for longevity steps, and a degree stipend amount to less than two-tenths of 1% of the total proposed school system budget for FY21. Providing the additional salary scale steps and longevity steps would ensure that we are we were being treated equitably in relation to TAPCO, AFSME, and ESBBC. Thank you. And can I give some copies to the members? Certainly. Staff will take them for you and hand them out. Our next speaker from the, for this evening is the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 434, Mr. Brian Epps. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Councilwoman Cosby, Vice, uh, uh, Vice Chair Hen, and Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. 
My name is Brian Epps, president of Ask Me Local 434. I come to this board tonight to ask you to look at the shortages that we are experiencing across the board. We all know about the shortages with bus drivers and bus attendants. We now have the routing assistants now driving buses, making the shortage in the office even more. But I'm also asking that we look at the shortage we have in the cafeteria workers, building service workers, and across the board of Ask Me. As we look at the budget, I would like to say that we're losing people to Walmart because they're paying just a little bit more than we are paying and causing our people to leave. So I ask that you consider, ask me people as you consider the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is from the Citizens Advisory for Gifted and Talented Education, Ms. Julie Miller-Breeds. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, board members, Dr. Williams, and the BCPS community. At the last BOE meeting, I mentioned that February is Gifted and Talented Month in Maryland, but given the dire potential loss of staffing to the Office of Advanced Academics, I didn't get to spend much time cheering on those who received awards at that recent statewide celebration. So tonight, with deep gratitude towards the board for protecting that office from virtual extinction and towards the individuals who were honored, I would like to take a moment to recognize them. Jennifer Madrid, a stat teacher at Lock Raven High School, Sarah McShane, a teacher at Hereford Middle School, and Amy Sanders, a resource teacher with the Office of Advanced Academics, were all honored for their excellence in gifted and talented academics. Let's take some of our own time and congratulate. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can just add back some time so she can catch a breath. <laughs> Thank you. Two students, one from Western Technical School and the other from Dumbarton Middle School, also received awards. And I, too, would like to congratulate those honorees. <laughs> I would also like to thank student member of the board, Omar Rashid, and Principal Sandra Reed for hosting the GTCAC's February meeting at Pikesville High School with community superintendents Christina Byers, Dr. Raquel Jones, and Dr. George Roberts. It was a really excellent meeting that was well attended and featured a lot of great discussion. We were also happy to have board members Lisa Mack and Cheryl Pescher in attendance there, along with BCPS's chief academic officer, Mary Boswell McComas. It is encouraging when there is a night with deep discussion about real issues surrounding gifted and talented education. With the advent of ESSA, the future of GT education really is primed to take a turn for the better. During the No Child Left Behind years, there was an imperative to get underachieving students up to grade level. That singular focus on struggling students pulled the focus away from other students in class. Between the years 2000 and 2007, the struggling students at the 10th percentile of achievement gained tremendously, while the students at the 90th percentile of achievement barely made any gains at all. ESSA changed that calculation by adding language for pro-excellence strategy to be used in state's K-12 accountability systems, thereby providing credit to schools that produced advanced learners. This promotes excellence in both our schools and society at large. Even so, researchers have found that the U.S. produces a much smaller proportion of advanced students than our, than our economic competitors, and in some cases, far smaller. There are decades of data that clearly show that our brightest kids need attention and they won't necessarily be just fine on their own. Neglect of Advanced learning has a price, and BCPS's own scores for advanced academic students are either stagnant or falling. We must support and, su support and serve these students and understand that they will have a unique learning profile that requires special education programs and services and teachers that can teach them. We will have our next meeting here in this room on Wednesday, March 4th at 7 p.m. Our April 1st meeting will also be here at 7 p.m., and we will be hosting Dr. Carrie Gabalt of Johns Hopkins, who will be talking about acceleration for GT students. Finally, the Office of Advanced Academics is having a series of community meetings over the next several weeks to explain changes to advanced academics as a result of Comar changes, so check their website for more information. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is from PTA Council of Baltimore County, President Jane Lee. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and board members. The overall purpose of PTA is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. 
thought I would repeat that since we have just celebrated our Founders Day of our organization that began on February 17, 1897. Now, the, your budget. As a parent, and even more so as a widowed parent, I've taught my children the difference between need versus want. I sat here till 1 a.m. at your last meeting and listened to a lot of I wants, we want, they want. I'm going to tell you that to be fiscally responsible, you need to make some tough decisions or someone else is going to make the cuts. And they may be the cuts of the things you need. What you need is people, staff, support staff, health services, mental health services, educator retention, and children that are safe in safe buildings and have stomachs that are full and the ability to learn. And that needs to be your priority in this budget. That being said, this board is also supposed to be nonpartisan. I would like, we have made great steps towards the future and with this board, but we need to now start to be nonpartisan. I don't hide my political lean, but yet I work with anyone. The mission of this group is what you need to think about, and that is the children, period. I've been reading the articles in the newspaper, and I'm not happy. The other thing I just wanted to say, and this is actually more personal, I guess, although I think if I took it to my board, I'd get a vote, and that is, you're placed on this board to make decisions, inform decisions, and unless there's a conflict of interest, you should be reading up, learning, and making decisions. Robert's Rules of Order protects the minority. The inspiration of my life was spending a day with Elie Wiesel, and his line was, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, not the tormented. Learn, read, and make a decision. I have been keeping a record of all the abstentions on this board, and I'm not happy. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to go to public comment. Our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening and welcome. Good evening to all. I would like to introduce to you Abdul Rahman Ibn Ibrahim. He was born in Timbuktu, West Africa. He was the son of King Ibrahim. He was also a colonel in his father's army. Abdul Rahman Ibn Ibrahim was scooped in 1788 and brought into West Indies as a slave. Then he was sold in Natchez, Mississippi. Abdul Rahman Ibn Ibrahim was a model slave. He was pious. And he, of course, he survived the hunger, the torture, the disease, the suicide on the slave ship, and also the strange milieu in Natchez, Mississippi. He did hold to his Islamic values of Timbuktu. One day, Abdul Rahman ibn Ibrahim was selling produce in the farmer's market. A white man saw him and recognized him as the son of King Ibrahim. This white man was the surgeon on the slave ship, and he owed his life to Abdul Rahman ibn Ibrahim and to the King Ibrahim. That basically ended the slavery of Abdul Rahman ibn Ibrahim, and he returned to West Africa free. On a different subject, this Board of Education has been under the influence of Annapolis and Towson for a long time. Jim Smith and his successor did not raise taxes, neglected the school system, so they can be the county executives who did not really raise county taxes. This led to the problems that we see today. And this is the reason why I speak to you about you being independent. 
You need to levy your taxes. You need to have a board that is elected by the people, impeached by the people, supervised by the people, so you can be independent. If you are not independent, you are going to always fall to Towson and Annapolis politics, will be influenced by it. And I know this is really a difficult subject, but the more I read about Board of Educations, the more I feel convinced that this board needs to consider to lobby our state and our county to make you honestly independent, because you are really not. You don't raise your taxes, and people want so much money, and we don't know where is it going to come from. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Diana Bergman. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, board members. I'm going to try to be very polite here, but I'm going to be very honest. I'm a little bit disappointed. Actually, I'm a lot disappointed. Okay, I think we need to focus on the need of our students in BCPS. And we need to lead by example. $630,000 for digital signs is not a need. We have other things we need to prioritize. Did any of you reach out to any of the teachers, assistant principals, resource teacher, everybody and their grandmother that I tagged in that email to talk to them specifically how they could better use 630,000 for inside the classroom instruction. As I called and checked up with everybody, and they haven't heard back from our board members. So that's why I'm really, really disappointed. We just had our case representative set an example about discrimination and how if the board members receive $7,500 for their service and how would certain women on the board feel if they received $1,000? Well, actually, our student member received $1,000 for the same amount of time that student member has been putting in. On top of that, we've taken away a lot of their voice, their one vote, the kids we represent in our school system. And he hasn't had a fair shot like the previous student members have to have their vote and say. And that's not leading by example. We're supposed to put their needs first. So I'm hoping legislation does pass to make it fair for the student board members after Omar that they get that grant money for $7,500 for the year. I hope that you guys could figure out how to move forward and really move forward and figure out how to work together in the best interest of our teachers so they actually feel supported. And Dr. Williams, hang in there. Make sure everybody's holding hands as they get through this because this is not gonna be easy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, I'm Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell, president of the Student Support Network, and my topic tonight is access to food programs in BCPS. From students visiting school nurses with symptoms of hunger to teacher and school staff reports about hungry students, we know hunger is a big problem in our schools. There are two existing programs that would benefit thousands of students in high poverty schools if BCPS would just expand them, Maryland Meals for Achievement, or MMFA, and the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP. MMFA is a highly successful program providing breakfast at no charge at qualifying schools with higher poverty rates. For about $720,000 a year, BCPS could fund breakfast in the classroom in 17 schools now eligible for MMFA but not participating. 
thousands of children would benefit, beginning with the most important meal of the day. High school students are not permitted credit or to charge meal accounts. Elementary and middle school students may charge only up to $6. The current policy of the Office of Food and Nutrition is to present students without money for breakfast with milk and a few graham crackers. This is not a meal and not acceptable. The list below my statement shows 17 schools that are eligible but not currently participating in MMFA. Secondly, as I communicated to you all about two weeks ago, I implore you not to take away the community eligibility BEP implemented in four of our poorest schools with the ending of this pilot program, Dundalk High, Hawthorne Elementary, Dundalk Middle, <clears throat> excuse me, and Riverview Elementary. To take away CEP at these schools would literally be taking food out of those children's mouths with no alternative for many of them after several years of breakfast and lunch offered at no charge. I understand that concern about CEP revolves around the possible loss of revenue to Title I schools because of changes required in calculating poverty rates, but many schools would not experience a loss and some would gain additional resources with CEP. This is not an insoluble problem. Hungry children who cannot learn should be a higher priority than reservations about changing to a new calculation of poverty. Changes which have been successfully navigated in over 17,000 schools implementing CEP, benefiting over 8 million students nationwide. Surely BCPS can figure this out too. There are two lists of schools qualifying for CEP below this statement. In conclusion, with an investment of just $1.2 million a year, BCPS could provide breakfast at no charge to students in 17 high poverty schools, maintain CEP in the current four schools, and could actually increase re federal reimbursements through implementing CEP in six additional schools. Compared with other budget items, food is relatively cheap. Greater access to, sc to food for in school for students in poverty, including many in poverty who are ineligible under the current income threshold is essential. They can't learn without food. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Allie Perlman Sachs. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, thank you. Um, good evening, Chairwoman Causey, um, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and the board. Um, I am a parent of a first grader and fourth grader at Lutherville Lab. Um, and I've been reading about BCPS's goal to be the highest performing school system. And I know this can't happen when teachers are not supported and encouraging, encouraged to do more and more with less and less. Um, it's a systemic issue. Teachers are afraid to talk and share concerns because they continue to feel afraid of the impact on their jobs. Teachers and teacher support and the staffs in our school work isn't um, encouraged and supported, yet we're adding more and more on for those individuals to do with less support. At our school this year and last year, they've implemented AVID, Conscious Discipline, Restorative Practice, Spanish, and the SEL program. Independently, these programs can, can be successful, but I don't think that, that our teachers being asked to implement all of those programs at one time can be effective. Um, our teachers are, are being taken away from doing their, their creative teaching as they um, are having to teach to the students um, to test. Um, quite frankly, we're even failing at that. Um, the, and the, the need in the classrooms, we're taking away resources for special education and asking teachers to manage large classrooms with significant need and then penalizing the teachers when students don't meet the standards of the test. It's a systemic issue. This is not the teacher's fault. This year our school implemented an SEL program. I know that you're aware of this, and which as you know has been a problem since the start of the school year. I've heard on multiple occasions BCPS say that, that they've given our school so much this year. Um, I'm gonna ask the board to really look at this because if making sure that a program that's supposed to provide structure and consistency for some of our most high need and vulnerable is staffed properly is considered so much, if ensuring teachers and other students are safe and have an environment to learn and grow is considered so much, if making sure parents whose children have witnessed children being restrained or eloping the school are communicated with is so much, if making sure that all children at the school's IEPs and 504s are being met is so much, 
if being asked that students that have the highest needs and behavioral challenges to have their needs met and to be given a safe and consistent environment is so much. If, at, if providing a safe school environment for all of our children is so much, then BCPS should be ashamed because so much hasn't even been enough at our school. Um, we will continue to advocate for special education students who deserve way better, and especially the current SEL program, which needs to be evaluated. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Lori Juliaris. Good evening and welcome, and please let me know if I said that correctly. It's Laura. Laura. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Williams, and board members, I want to truly thank you for the thoughtful, constructive questioning that many of you brought forth at the last boarding, board meeting regarding the Pleasant Plains Boundary Study. I could tell you've been listening to the points we've had, and I'm sincerely appreciative of that we are being heard. I know you take your roles seriously and want the best for our kids, as we all do. Because option B will send Hampton Elementary into overcrowded status as soon as next year, BCPS still needs to research alternate options. Let's dig deeper and explore these solutions that you mentioned, including number one, using Cromwell El Valley Elementary to its full potential. If a short-term solution is needed, there are still a lot of questions left unanswered as to why CVES cannot help provide capacity relief. It is not currently at capacity, and the kids count projections show it will not be at capacity until four school years from now. I sincerely hope the next four years fall within the definition of short term. It's evident that people are spending valuable time and effort creating these projections, so let's put their hard work to good use. Let's utilize these open seats, at least in the short term. Number two, exploring the use of Bicota Senior Center. I love this suggestion from you, Mr. Kuhn. As you noted, it's, an ideal, it's in an ideal location for the areas needing relief. And I don't think anyone disagrees that these areas are going to continue to grow. So by using that building now, we could plant the seeds for much needed long-term solutions. Number three, planning for development and growth. I simply cannot agree with the comments the representatives of the study committee made about aging communities and droves of kids aging out of elementary schools. In my experience, as soon as a house in our central area becomes available, a family with preschool or elementary school aged kids move in. Also, the multi-unit high-rises that have already been built are not predominantly studios, but instead include many two and three bedrooms. Multiple bedrooms lend themselves to families, not singles or retired couples. It is evident to me that the central region is where families want to be. And why is that? Because of the amazing schools. And I think we all want to keep it that way. Ms. Causey mentioned the new Northeast Elementary School. Where is BCPS in the planning for that? It may be able to aid in relief for Pleasant Plains. And in the more immediate future, Pleasant Plains needs to be on the capital improvement plan because no matter what happens with this decision, it is still going to be overcrowded, needing more relief. I want to be clear that we are advocating not just for Hampton and on behalf of Pleasant Plains, but for sweeping change. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Amanda Holter Eisenhart. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Superintendent Williams, Madam Clausey, Vice Chair Hen. I come to you as a parent from Joppa View Elementary. And while I have a much different opinion about school signs, I'd like to thank the board members for advancing and allowing our school sign upgrade the opportunity to be considered in the budget. You may say to yourself, this is a silly item to consider, but Joppa View Elementary desperately needs a new electronic sign in place of the old marquee style sign. Currently, we're very limited in the amount of characters we can place on the sign and the information which we can share with the community. 
Being on such a busy road gives us advantages to get the word out about wonderful cultural programs we offer to our students and the community. Although it brings several challenges regarding safety and parking, which is very limited on our school property. Having a new sign to communicate with the community when parking is available off-site will impact the day-to-day -day lives, uh, and it's just another reason to support the sign. Joppa View Elementary was titled a lighthouse school and a leader in technology, yet the first thing you see when you approach the campus for our scholars is an old outdated sign. We want to brighten our campus and live up to the technology advanced title that we've earned. Joppa View has suffered with having our school time pushed back in effort to accommodate the new Honeygo Elementary School. Constantly being promised a reduction in attendance and relief, which was also not yet occurred at our location. We are simply requesting updates that are automatically granted to new schools being built. The Joppa View Elementary PTA has been fundraising for this item, but it is simply a task we've been unable to obtain without assistance. And we also are having to meet the criteria and using vendors within the BCPS guidelines. The PTA should be enriching the lives of children and students, not paying for property upgrades like signs and playgrounds. But that task is what our parents are being faced with. The cost of the sign is something we are prepared to assist with if absolutely necessary. However, we cannot provide the electrical wiring upgrades which are needed to be run from the school out to the sign. We are asking at a minimum you allow the upgrades for electric to maintain in your budget and meet us halfway in making improvements to our campus one of our, and one of our main communication methods. We know the sign will recoup the cost of fundraising opportunities and we would like to thank Vice Chair Chen for her attendance in different activities at our school, the support she has shown us within our school, and the way that she continues to sail above expectations and show support in the area that she serves, along with Councilman Marks, who has witnessed our program firsthand. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Amanda Wolf. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, board members, uh, Vice Chair Hen, Chairwoman Causey, and Superintendent Dr. Williams. My name is Amanda Wolf. Um, I've been a parent at Luther Lab Elementary for the past five years. I've gotten to know the teachers and the administration past and present, and this year I've been consistently in the school two days a week, doing what I can to help the teachers and staff. But I'm not here tonight to tell you, to th tell you all the things I've tried to do to help the school climate and the morale improved this year. I'm not even here asking you to help get the SEL program out of our school. Instead, I want to give you just a glimpse of how this school year has gone so far for one of our best teachers we have or possibly had at Lutherville Lab. Because frankly, I'm tired of the administration in our school sweeping things under the rug and pretending like everything is fine. This teacher is in her 24th year of teaching in Baltimore County. She's a national board certified teacher certified in special education, among other acc accolades. She voluntarily chose to become an SEL teacher this year as the program trans transitioned from Cromwell Valley Elementary to Lutherville Lab. Unfortunately, this year did not go as planned and she is currently on a leave of absence and has been for the past few months. So how did this happen? In short, she has been failed by the administration at our school, the SEL program countywide, and BCPS. Her blood pressure was the worst it had been in her life. Her stress and anxiety was off the charts. She wasn't sleeping, wasn't eating, wasn't taking care of herself. Let me backtrack for a second. After one week of aggressive behaviors, fighting and out of control language from her students between them and towards her, just one week into the school year, she walked herself into the principal's office and voiced her concerns with her class and the SEL program feeling like she would not be able to teach in the current conditions she was being asked to. And what response did she receive? A phone call the next morning saying she had two choices. One, she could resign, or she could continue in her current position. So basically, she was told to quit or suck it up. Really, is this the best we can do in BCPS? This is what we tell a 24-year veteran teacher trying to be vulnerable, honest, and reach out for help. We just tell her to quit or push through. So now instead of teaching, as she planned this year, 
She's at home trying to heal emotionally while figuring out what her future looks like, as she isn't sure who she can trust anymore in BCPS. I would like to say that she is the only teacher I've had to recommend counselors to this year. She isn't. There are teachers daily emo having emotional breakdowns because the SEL program is taking such a huge emotional toll on them, their families, and their health. I urge you to seriously reconsider this, the SEL program, not just at Lutherville, but throughout the county. From what I've seen this year, the SEL program is failing our school, it's failing our students, and it's definitely failing our teachers. Our administration was not ready to handle this program. They were struggling with discipline, adhering to IEP and 504 accommodations, and school climate. Our next speaker for the evening is Amy Lamb. <coughs> Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Amy Lamb, and I am a parent of a second grader and kindergartner at Hampton. I am also a graduate of Hampton, and I recall when we absorbed students from Cromwell when Cromwell closed in the 80s. I can attest, from that time until now, Hampton has always been and will continue to be the most welcoming and nurturing school family any child could hope for. Sorry. <laughs> when I attended one of the boundary study meetings, I was shocked, angered, and saddened to hear of the conditions at Pleasant Plains. That said, I find myself still needing to advocate for my own children, despite my outrage over the situation at Pleasant Plains. Hampton's parents' concerns about the proposed plans are not about Hampton opposing assisting Pleasant Plains. Hampton will welcome any child, no matter what planning block they live in. Our concerns have arisen from the sheer magnitude of students Hampton is solely being asked to absorb. We understand Pleasant Plains frustrations since we were just in the same place seven years ago. I ask that the board explore some sort of alternate plan outside of option B. As has been discussed before, the proposed plan only partially solves Pleasant Plains problem, puts Hampton in a position to shoulder the entire issue, and then creates a similar problem at Hampton. This is akin to a doctor only treating the symptoms of her patient instead of addressing the underlying cause of the disease. On the surface, the boundary studies option B seems fairly logical. Shifting 100 students to Hampton seems like the quickest fix to help Pleasant Plains. However, I do have some questions. I've heard the words short term quite a bit recently and I ask, what is short term? For one child, this short term plan is likely to last at least half of their BCPS experience. For the entire central region, we are essentially looking at a whole generation of children in overcrowded elementary school classrooms. Will Pleasant Plains' future capital needs now be ignored or delayed as a result of this short-term solution? Under option B, Hampton will be immediately over 100% capacity just before numerous residential developments are slated to open. Will we be back here in a year fighting to have Hampton's boundaries shifted? What can BCPS do to create meaningful collaboration with Baltimore County government and planners to address the larger systemic issue of development that leads to overcrowding in the first place? Option B does buy some time, but to what end? What is the plan for Hampton after shifting 100 students and then when the new residences open? Hampton's common areas like the cafeteria and gymnasium are already well over capacity because they were not expanded during Hampton's renovation. We respectfully ask that the board explore sweeping changes, not quick fixes. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Tia Knott. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for hearing me. Um, my name is Tia Knott. I think you all know that. <laughs> I'm a proud parent at Lutherville Lab. I have made three speeches for tonight and I'm not going with any of them. I want to sit up here and I want to look you all in the eyes. You hear problems, you hear fighting, you hear all the concerns of Baltimore County. It's time to make massive changes. Things have got to change. We can't keep looking at budget from last year. Where do we add more money? Start afresh. What do we need? We need kids that have teachers that want to teach. We have kids. We need kids 
to be able to be educated. We need teachers to have smaller classrooms. We need teachers to feel supported. We cannot keep shoving people around, putting band-aids on school, shifting properties areas. We cannot do this. This is not benefiting anybody. Our school, our class sizes have gone from 15 when I moved there intentionally to 28. You cannot have 28 kids in a class and intimately get to know those kids. That is a teacher's job in elementary school. Get those kids to love education. They are not. They're not safe in the schools. The classrooms are being taken up. There's not enough room. And this is worldwide. This is the whole county. People want to move to Baltimore County, and they're not anymore. They're moving out. We've got to go back to the basics. Where does money need to be spent? It needs to be spent in a way that is going to get our children educated. Not to the MCAP, but they're going to be educated. They're going to know division because they worked hard to earn it, not because they were taught five different ways to do it and to put it in boxes. They need to learn them because they are life lessons that they can carry on. They need to remember the teachers that they had that made impacts on them, that get them through college, that get them into the career, that make them good parents to fight for their own kids' education. We've got to make Baltimore County what it should be. Um, that's all I have, but I really appreciate your time, and I've been praying hard on this. And you guys, God can move this mountain for us. Let's move it. Thank you. Our final speaker for the evening is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening and welcome. I'm sorry for my absence the last time we had a meeting, but I'm going to be very upfront here. We need to look at how we treat our teachers, and we need to look at how we pay our teachers and because they are the ones that are going to be exposed, I should say, teaching our students to be tomorrow's leaders. I have spent the better part of the last two weeks listening to administrators, not from the schoolhouse, but from central office, telling me that it's okay for a teacher to be abused by a student. That it's okay for a teacher to not have a say in how they teach their students. I have listened to administrators threatening teachers in IEP meetings so that the teacher does not want to advocate for something that the, t that the student needs. I have students right now who are going to be going to mediation to get what they need. And as a parent who's been through that, no one should have to go through that. We have a teacher shortage because teachers are leaving. They're leaving because we don't support them and we don't care about them. And if we don't care about our students and our teachers, how do we expect our students to behave? They aren't gonna behave in a proper manner. They aren't gonna feel supported and they aren't gonna to go to school. <clears throat> I have a client right now who has been cutting every single day. Because he doesn't feel safe in his schoolhouse, he wants to learn, but he's cutting because he doesn't feel safe. So what is he doing? He's outside of the schoolhouse. We need to support our teachers. We need to make sure our administrators feel supported too. And we're not doing a very good job of it by make, asking them to Thank you. We're now going to our public comment portion for policies and for 
policy 2380 i call forward ms diana bergman and then it will be dr Farron. Good evening, board members. This is policy 2380. I have a lot of questions. You know, I am glad that I'm able to have three minutes to talk about this. But 1.5 to $3 million on retention of records. I heard in the previous board meeting that we were running out of room for storing stuff like paperwork, paperwork, and we don't even know what it is. I mean, let's be honest. We had three elementary schools that closed, and those three elementary schools got new buildings. And the staff in that school decided, example, Lansdowne Elementary is one of those schools in my community, decided they didn't want to take those 20-something years of stuff they had in their old building into the new building. And it got sent, I think, to that warehouse where we have all textbooks and uh, tons of records that were running out of space because we're not destroying anything with this policy that was put in place from a, free, a previous board. And why are we hoarding? Why is Baltimore County hoarding stuff that people didn't want to take into a new building? and spending taxpayers' dollars to store stuff. Stuff that we could have a process to destroy properly and at least, you know, yeah, I do agree paying some of that money to put it up in the cloud somewhere electronically. But physically, space, you have parents here complaining that they don't have room and we move kids around like we're playing a, a game with them from building to building, then we're going to spend more money throughout five years, a lot of money, millions of dollars, to store stuff that people, some people didn't even want to begin with. Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's not accountable nor responsible to spend taxpayers' dollars on keeping stuff that you don't even know if we really even need it. Like, we can't keep this stuff forever and then run out of space and then actually pay square footage for paper that we don't even want when we can't figure out how to create square footage for programs that students actually need. Take it back to the committee and figure out how to fix this. But that policy cannot stay there. It's costing us too much money. Dr. Ferron. Good evening again. I'll keep it brief. I have six questions or recommendations to consider. When I look at the one and a half to three million dollar possible impact on the record issue, to me it looks like a whole lot of money for information system. I probably estimate the number will go up maybe to four or five by the time the board assess it. So as we spend so much on issues like this, that takes away money from building, building maintenance, hiring teachers, et cetera. Um, the second point is, would the board maybe consider outside company to take care of it instead of being inside? Um, I know. Amazon and Microsoft and Apple have invaded all our lives in so many ways. Maybe they can do it with less amount of money and better efficiency and effectiveness. My fourth point to you, and it's really just an idea. All learning areas in the state of Maryland, 24 of them, have the same issue with medical records, with school records. Why not team up all together? and have one system, everybody really stores in one location, everybody in all learning areas. And if you have books or things that are sentimental, et cetera, you know, you can still do it, just like the National Library for Congress, you know, it's a depository. 
this might be more efficient than every school system spends so much money on the issue. Um, the last but not least, um, I don't know if this policy allows it, but you know, I like to write a book about my 25 year experience with all the boards that I worked with and superintendent. And I like it to be good. So I like to have an access to all these records. And if I send Freedom of Information Act to our honorable system, I have to give out all my retirement money because it really costs so much, all right? It's per page, all right? And I don't have that much of money anyhow. So I wonder really if you can do something about that last part and make it accessible, all right, if somebody wants to research something. And since I mentioned the book that I like to write, I really like you as a Board of Education to move on, to be positive, to be accomplishing, no feuds, all work towards school system, because I like the ending of my book to be so nice, so it sells more. <laughs> Thank you. Our next policy is policy 5510, conduct positive behavior. It is being renamed as positive school climate. And for that, we have Ms. Bergman, uh, Ms. Saroff, Ms. Sullivan, and Dr. Farad. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry, I've been a little harsh. I still like you guys, you know? I, I, I do, I really do. It's just, this is a very frustrating situation. So let's talk about positive school climate. I like this subject. Because if the children feel safe, comfortable, and the climate in their schoolhouse is positive, they look forward coming into the building. So some of the things that I think also that's very important to maintain that positive climate in the schoolhouse is actually dedicating time to make sure our students have the tools to problem solve and resolve conflicts amongst themselves. It should be across the board. They should be able to see modeled examples when a teacher is talking to a colleague or their administrator that creates that positive climate, along with the parents and the school community, too. Um, it's a full picture. So I know you're changing the name to positive um, school climate, but think outside the box when it comes to this. This is a big family. Each schoolhouse is a big family. Yeah, there's some people you might not like, like Uncle Joe, but you figure out the tools to get along. So we have to create a more proactive climate in our schoolhouses. Because for a really long time, Baltimore County has been on a reaction type of mode. Always busy reacting, you know, you call central office staff, they're putting out fires over here, putting out fires over there. No, I want that central office staff inside the schoolhouse. In 2012, we used to even have them a lot closer. We used to lease square footage in the Southwest area, and we were able to have central office staff available there. And they weren't all the way up here in Towson. They were right there. They could have central um, IEP team meetings. It was a lot more productive. But let's bring them into the schoolhouse because it's gonna be a lot of fun to make that climate positive. So that's all I gotta say there. I still like you guys. Thank you, and we uh, now have Ms. Sharon Saroff. <laughs> I'm gonna read from your policy as my starting point. Each school shall support students in learning skills necessary to enhance a positive school climate, avoid problem behavior, 
and discourage violations of the code of student conduct. How do we do that? This policy needs to help schools, teachers, administrators, students problem solve, be proactive, not reactive. And I'm putting the accent on those things because what I see a lot of in my profession is reactive. We have a problem, we need to react. Well, how about being proactive? Give the teachers their, the support that they need. You can't expect a classroom of 28 kids to not act out. I've been in the schoolhouse. I taught classes of that size. And I can tell you that no matter how much character development you're teaching those kids, that's too big a class. We have to model that behavior to the students. Modeling includes the relationship between the administrator in the building and the, and the teachers and how welcoming that building is to everyone. I'm going to tell you a little quick story. My daughter went to Timber Grove Elementary School. The principal of that school decided after six weeks of dealing with my son that he didn't belong there. Her staff didn't feel welcome in her building because of the way it looked, because of the way she treated and led by lack of example. When my daughter was in fifth grade, we got a new principal in that building. And she was very, very welcoming. And she decorated the building, and she made the parents feel welcome. And there were fewer problems with students in that building because everyone felt welcome and supported and needed. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Our next policy is policy 5520 student conduct, student dress code, and we have Ms. Bergman and Dr. Farron. Point of order, did you miss a speaker for the from that last policy? Excuse I believe me? Ms. Sullivan was supposed to speak on oh, the I'm last sorry. policy. I'm sorry, uh, it's Ms. Deb, Deb Sullivan on 5510, and then Dr. Farron after that. I won't take it personal. <laughs> Thank you for the chance to speak tonight. Um, school climate is an issue that I've addressed in the past. This climate begins at the top. It starts with the board, goes to the principals, the teachers, and then the students. School climate will never change if leadership does not reflect that change. Students will never stop bullying, disrespect, disrespecting each other and teachers and disruptions in the building if it, that example is not set from the top. We have an emergency situation at hand, all right. It's of great concern to me. Is it the sex offender and rapist in the school? Is it the bullying in the classroom? Is it forcing young children to commit, contemplate suicide? The assaults, the disrespect of teachers dismissed daily by principals? No, by the press, it's none of these. It's simply a vote of six to five, which doesn't meet the BCPS bylaws ruling of the majority of seven. Folks, six is greater than five, true, in first grade math. It's not greater than five if there's a rule that states the majority of the value is seven. That rule works as long as, as it is in a small group's favor, a small group of descenders who want to overthrow this governing body, a small group of descenders who wanted Miss White to be in that chair instead of Dr. Williams, a small group that did not want the search for Dr. Williams or any other excellent candidate. Dr. Williams, a man of highest integrity 
and character and reputation. A small group of dissenters who voted against Dr. Williams. And we know the record will state those votes. How are the principals to change their attitude if we cannot change the attitude of this board? We're grown-ups. We need to play well together in the sandbox. What are we teaching the children? Well, let's kick, stomp, rally supporters, take it to Annapolis, get legislators to change a law, an emergency bill. Good Lord, that gets to be read immediately. Don't wait till June. Don't wait till December for the next vote because there's a threat to public safety and the health and well-being in Baltimore County. What's the threat? Is it school climate? Absolutely not. It's the threat that the corruption that's still hiding under the rug from Dallas and Dance, Dallas Dance, excuse me, Verletta White's leadership might surface. Corruption of turning a blind eye to the violent offenders in our schools and the school climate issues that we are facing with bullying, fighting, and disrespect. We need to set a positive ex example of leadership. Descenders, you're a minority in your school of thought. You've lost touch with what is in the best interest of students and children and our communities. And the school. The final speaker for policy 5510 is Dr. Farone. Yes. Conduct positive behavior. Okay, policy 5510, briefly, six points. Students must respect teachers. No ifs, no buts. That's how I grew up. I think that's the right way. If they don't, they don't learn. They don't respect police. They don't respect judges. They don't respect the president, etc. I like the policy to define positive ethical behavior. Third point, I really want to impress on you to get the drugs out of the school system. <coughs> drugs must be out. If they are not really out and being used inside or outside, whatever reason it is, that creates behavior problem. A sign around the school, drug-free zone, is worthless. I'd like you to define positive behavior and ethical decision-making. And last but not least, from what I know, teachers are not really comfortable talking to parents about behavior issues, and I understand that. But we cannot really blame it all on the school system, and we cannot really not intervene with parents. So the teacher is not really just a teacher to the students, the teacher needs to be also a teacher to the parents to make sure that the parents are supportive and enforcing the same ethical and positive behavior that this school system wants to teach our students. And if they don't have time, they are not going to do that. So it really goes back to the issue of money. You know, adequate staffing, adequate support, adequate whatever, it's all connected together. Please consider. Thank you. Our next policy is policy 5520, student conduct, student dress code. And we have uh, Ms. Diana Bergman and uh, Dr. Bosch Farron. Fifty-five twenty student dress code. Some schools in BCPS um, have uniforms. Um, my son goes to one of those schools. And I like it. We're talking about dress code. It's, there's nothing on it. It's just a color. It encourages school pride and improves the school climate. For secondary students, 
it might be a good thing to help us get some structure and unity to improve school climates for middle school and high school if we include that as part of the dress code. Something to try out, larger jurisdiction over time, um, moved in that direction for public schools for their secondary um, students and eventually their elementary. Miami-Dade County is one of those public school systems. The uh, majority of their students wear uniforms. So pertaining to this policy is covering things to make sure that kids are not wearing stuff that's inappropriate or offensive to others. So I just wanted to consider the possibility that we could explore that in BCPS, at least for secondary, particular middle school students, if we could try that out to improve the dress code. That's all. Thank you. Dr. Ferron? As you may know, I wasn't born in Towson. When I grew up, I had a uniform, and the uniform is supposed to be simple and clean. And everybody has the same uniform, same color. The girls have certain length that cannot go up, and I think it worked. Now, I know, as American, this is not back home. But I honestly think a dress code that is uniform and simple would work better. Because when my kids went to Baltimore County Public School and they were affected by the same culture around them, some of them did dress inappropriate, despite my teaching and my wife's teaching. And it tells what's the inside of that teenager. Right, so a pant that is going below the waist, showing things, may not really be a good reflection of the student and maybe a sign of a problem. So it's not really about fashion, it's not about imposing fees, but you know, I, I reflect on my past and I reflect on, I think, the United States Army, Air Force, Navy, etc where they have a dress code that reflects the character of their servicemen and women. And I know our students are not really soldiers and we are not training them to be soldiers, but if they have a uniform and if the girls don't have showing clothes that distract others in the class and invites things, and if the male students have a dress code that is conservative in nature, I think it will teach them something beyond just the dress itself. Um, I may not be um, making a point to some, but that's the advantage of immigrants. I think it worked for me and for many, many people who were like me and came here and became successful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next policy is policy 5530, conduct student use and possession of tobacco, which is being renamed as student use and possession of tobacco products. Hi. So I like the new name. Um, but the policy should also have language very specific when it comes to dipping. Um, I see this in my local high school, especially some of the teenage boys that play during the summer rec ball. They got dip in their mouth. That's tobacco, chewing tobacco. They put it on their lip. You know, that's a <laughs> and um, they're sneaky about it. They're learning in class and they're dipping. They got a soda can and you might think they're drinking soda, but no, they're spitting right into it. Some of them have some skills, they spit right into the straw, it goes right in, like, it looks like they're drinking soda, they're not, they're dipping in class while they're learning. 
And over time, that creates health problems. Because if they're not properly maintaining hygiene of their gums and their teeth, it could lead to things like heart disease and other complications. So I would like to see some language in the policy, definitely in the rule, um, addressing and identifying dipping um, to educate students to harm with dipping. Because I've even seen it at um, Lansdowne High School. I've seen girls dipping. So it's not something people talk about. Everybody's focusing on everything that's going on with the vapes and stuff. It drives us crazy. Some of the stuff smells nice, some of it doesn't. And we also have parents visiting the school grounds that are also vaping and using tobacco products um, you know, throughout the school grounds. So I would like to make sure at least that we do address some of the things we, we're seeing. I know not every community might see it, something like that, but I'm definitely seeing it in, in my community. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Excuse me, Dr. Ferron. Policy 5530, briefly three points. My inside information in the school system tells me that in some schools, some students go into the bathroom, close the door, and they have a, one of the students as a watch person alerting them if the principal or some authority is coming nearby and they are smoking or doing whatever they are doing. So I know you know I'm a physician, so tobacco should not really be in schools or around school, all right? It, it, it's really obvious. And that's the same for drugs, same for alcohol, and I believe the same for sugary stuff. And I talked to you last time about French fries and, and Kentucky French fries and Kentucky chicken. Um, it also goes to the role of students to talk to the parents when they notice that their child is using a drug and nicotine is a drug or alcohol or whichever. And if the teachers don't have enough help, if the teachers have a class of 28 and the back half of it is not listening or propping their log, legs on, on the desk or, you know, to chatting together, they are not going to have time to talk to parents. So it really goes back to many of the things behind me that many of the other parents and teachers asked for more money for both teachers and aides and other uh, help. It's all connected together. If we really don't, um, get the drugs, all kinds, out of our school system, and we don't install in our kids the importance of not solving issues by going into drugs, whether it's cigarettes or anything else, we are not doing them a favor. And they grow up and they become a burden on the legal system, on health care, and more than that. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, but there was no action taken in closed session. So moving right along to new business, contract awards. Um, and for that, I call on Mr. Saris to present the contract awards and um, Ms. Hen can facilitate that. Good evening, Mr. Saris. Good evening. So we have uh Two items this evening, the first of which is CWA 124-20 marching band uniforms. This is a new cooperative contract for marching band uniforms for the Department of Academics. Approval is requested for a two-year, eight-month contract with the option to extend for two one-year extensions with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $885,000. Fantastic, thank you, Mr. Saris. Good evening, Ms. Shea. Good evening. 
Board members, are there any questions? Ms. Causey? So in reading the um, one page uh, <coughs> summary for the spending authority, um, it mentions two schools, but is this budget amount of $885,000 over the two years and eight months, is that only for two schools or how many additional schools? Thank you. So um, the 885000 is actually um, over if we were able to also have the two-year extension. So it's really more over a five-year period. Okay. Um, and that would be based on the idea that we would have um, roughly a budget of 180000 as ongoing each year to spend on marching band uniforms. So depending on whether we were purchasing new uniforms um, for a, a band with um, any number of members, which varies by school, versus replacing or upkeeping a band that already has uniforms would vary the amount of schools that we were able to serve each year. So my team put together um, sort of a predictive plan over five years based on the age of the marching bands in our different school and where we might go next each year in terms of who was ready and had a marching band without a uniform versus who might have uniforms and need a replenishment and um, came up with a cycle for how that could happen each year. Okay, thank you. So sure. the cycle would, over five years, include all of the marching bands throughout the county? So it would include um, all of those that are on the horizon to have a new marching band. So we have a few that, for example, had started with drum line in the hopes of building a marching band, as well as every school that has a current marching band having that replenishment happen in the five-year cycle. Um, we may get lucky and within the five years have another school that might also um, seek to start a marching band, which would be a wonderful problem, but that would then impact the cycle. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Ms. Pester and then Mr. McMillian. Ms. Ms. Pester, did you have your hand raised? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kuhn. I saw a hand in that direction. Mr. Kuhn and then Mr. McMillian. Um, so I see on the right up that you have targeted three schools um, in this fiscal year. Can you um, let us know what it costs? Like, what is the average cost per school? I guess per band, and how many uniforms are we talking about per? Right. That's a great question. Um, so I can share with you that, again, it depends on the size of the marching band. So for example, um, Milford Mill currently has um, 96 members, only five of whom are, are seniors, and they're expected to add 34 members next year. So we're talking well over 100 students. Um, my understanding, and this is um, the band uniform experts tell me that when you order uniforms, you can't order one for one because obviously students come in all shapes and sizes. So when um, outfitting a band of over 100 students, you actually um, purchase uniforms more than the exact number of students that you have in the band. Um, so when looking at the purchase for Milford Mill, that um, school would range in like the $150,000 just to outfit that band um, in that particular year. However, Patapsco just needed refreshers, so they were only ordering around 10 uniforms and some other items. Um, that was around a $15,000, so there's a very wide range. Um, I can tell you that um, there's a number of items that we purchase. So for example, um, a band coat, it runs in around a $200 range. Um, the cape is around another $200. The, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong and someone's going to send me an email, but I think it's called a Shaco hat. <laughs> um, is it Shaco or Shaco? I wasn't sure. Um, is around $62. So you can see how the prices add up. So again, I can't give you an exact cost per band because it would depend on the number of March. Um, but I can tell you that to outfit Milford Mill with the um, healthy size of their marching band for next year, that purchase order would be in the one hundred fifty to one hundred sixty thousand dollar range. And how long? Great question. So um, obviously, it would depend on wear and tear. So um, Patapsco's, I believe, was um, purchased within the last six or seven years. I will tell you our data is slightly thin because typically many of these uniforms have been purchased by um, boosters and haven't been within the purview of our office. So I myself don't have purchase history. Um, but Patapsco was the first school that I've worked with, and they only needed to replace about 10 uniforms after having them for six to seven years. So that's my best. Yes. One question. Sure. Um, so this is an extension for two years, uh, and and you, and it's a five-year time frame we're looking at here. That was the timeline we used to calculate our spending authority. If we had that ongoing amount of one hundred eighty thousand over five years. Mm -hmm. So, 
with the activity that you're planning or predicting, are um, booster organizations matching or working with you on this, or is this just we're centralizing it and now we're buying everything? Great question. So, um, and Mr. Saras can certainly chime in. This year, we were given these funds when the budget came back to us um, from the county executive, and it included $180,000 for the purposes of purchasing band uniforms. Prior to that, it was not a request that our offices had made in the budget, but rather something that came back in that cycle. And so then we sought to have a contract to enable us to purchase on their behalf. Um, that doesn't necessarily preclude boosters from doing it. They would not spend against this contract, this contract would solely be for the funds we have as a school system to purchase uniforms. Did I say all that? Thank right? you. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Mr. McMillian? <clears throat> I might be able to answer my own question. Okay. Is there a reason, there, is the reason we didn't have the Building and Contracts Committee meeting today prior to this Board of Education meeting because there were two contracts? That's my understanding, but... That is my understanding as well, because these two were um, last minute additions and because there were only two, so it came to the full board. Thank you. Sure. Board members, any other questions regarding this contract award? Hearing none? No? I just want to correct Dr. something. Um, it's time sensitive because these uniforms have to be made. Correct. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say last minute. It was time sensitive, hence we had to move these contracts early than what we would normally do in our right. cycle. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Great. Mr. Saris, would you please present the next contract So award? the second Thank and you, final Sarah. item is uh, CWA 125-20 cut sheet paper. This is a new competitively bid cooperative contract. For the purchase of letter and legal size paper for schools and offices, approval is requested for a one-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $1.4 million. And the reason that we brought this forward uh, is because our current contract expires February 29th. And we wanted to make sure we work with Anne Arundel County as the lead agency in cooperation with ourselves and Howard County. And Anne Arundel opened this bid on February 3rd, and we wanted to make sure that we could get it to the board uh, in a timely basis. Thank you. Board members, any questions? <clears throat> Mr. McMillian? As you gentlemen know, I spent a lot of time in the school buildings, and paper was always an issue, it seemed to be. What's the formula for taking this paper and dividing it up among the 175 schools? Uh, how, how's that going to happen? It's uh, purchased centrally by the warehouse, and then it's issued to schools as they request it, and it comes out of their budgets. So. The, the 1.4 million is for all schools and offices, and, and it's not free necessarily. So the respective schools submit their, their order to the warehouse, and then right. their, their monies are taken out of their budgets, and then the paper's delivered to the schools. Correct. Okay, thank you. Great. Mr. Kuhn? So this is just a single year request? Correct. This is uh, how we have been doing it for several years. Uh, the price of paper is somewhat volatile and uh, we're saving about 9% by doing it this way, but uh, the contract also provides for the uh, the company to have certain stock on hand to be able to deliver large quantities to our designated location and so forth. Yes, um, this is just one year. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve items J1 and J2? Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. McMillian, for the second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Shea. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thanks.
So just to recap, um, on January 9th, I presented the a proposed FY21 operating budget. There was a public hearing scheduled on January 14th, a work session on the operating budget on January 21st, and an additional work session was held on February 11th. Um, what we're here today is to hear any additional questions with the goal of the board accepting and approving an FY21 budget to then proceed to our county executive. And I turn it back over to Dr. Scriven and his team. Good evening, Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris, Mr. Tantliff. Good evening. Good evening. So, board members, we received in board docs an update from Dr. Williams' staff related to the uh, motions at, that were approved by the Board of Education at our last meeting in terms of additions or uh, reductions or uh, transitions within the budget. So, at this time, if board members have questions or comments, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Saris, correct me if I'm wrong for my limited knowledge of budgets, which I've been doing for 20 years. The motion to redirect um, the technology and supplies of 630,000 to the 14 signs, isn't that a capital budget um, and not really a uh, operating budget item? And I don't know if Mr. Dixit or you could clarify that. So it is, uh, it's really not a redirect, it's adding the $630,000 in new revenue and expenses. Um, each uh, sign based on this price of between thirty dollars and $60,000, depending on the specifics, um, will be recorded in our capital asset inventory, but it has never been um, a true capital project um, unless it comes as part of a new school. So that would be if you have a new school, it's part of the new school, they have the electronic science and it's part right. of the capital budget. Right. Um, and am I correct that if it is not a new school, usually it's through a private funding, fundraisers, the it electronic has, it science? It has been both, but lately, uh, yeah, it has been. Uh, a special project or donation type uh, undertaking. So is this the proper, should this be in the operating budget then, this item? Or, yeah, I think if we're going to do this, it is an operating budget item. Okay, thank you. Yes. Board members, other questions or comments? Mr. McMillian. I want to make a motion. Sure. Is that okay? As you're aware, Ms. Mack is not here tonight. She's under the weather, and I know she's home watching the stream. Uh, this is actually her motion. I'm reading it, and I'll take responsibility for it. I move that in the proposed budget for the fiscal year 2021 that BCPS rescind a previous action approved by the board on February 11th, 2020 to terminate the innovative learning contract ARA-210-19 for Culture Grams, SIRS Discovery, and SIRS Issue Researcher. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hen, for the second. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. And the 2-20 curriculum meeting, staff provided a much more robust accounting of usage for these three products and a lower cost, and explained that the 600, and, excuse me, the 464 views were for abstracts only, not full text articles, which were reflected in the revised usage data provided. Additionally, Ms. Mack and I met with the media specialists at Kenwood High School to see how two of these products are used, and the overview provided was very enlightening. Thank you. Board members, questions or comments, discussion of the motion? I would just like to say I did read over the um, 
revised usage, and that was very helpful in terms of um, reevaluating that. So I think that we appreciate staff reviewing uh, and providing additional data to the board so that we could make uh, a more informed decision. And I also understand that uh, within a short time there has been um, negotiations and a reduction in the price for uh, not this product, it's a different product. So, um, so we appreciate staff also understanding the board's perspective of uh, while we want to provide instructional materials to make sure that we're doing it as cost effectively as possible. Ms. Rowe? I would just like to thank the children at Orem's Elementary School for their um, contribution to the policy discussion. Um, for people watching, you didn't see it, but they sent us a booklet that they hand wrote in all of the things that they liked about this software and why they thought we should keep it. And I, I think that it's fantastic that our elementary school students are paying attention and participating in our budget process. Ms. Pasture. I want to thank uh, the staff for the excellent presentation they made at the uh, curriculum meeting that very carefully and clearly outlined SIRS. Uh, and if they are watching, all of the teachers who have emailed us about the benefits of it, um, uh, the program is absolutely wonderful and it is essential and sometimes without even knowing that we're seeing it when we watch our children present and perform they are going uh, or, or using that um, a digitized method in addition to which it, it has many levels for um, our secondary students dealing with research opportunities for discussion and debate uh, knowing uh, two sides, more sides of a particular issue, doing projects, so it has so many levels. So again, thanks to the staff for making it all very clear. And thank you to Ms. Mack, who I'm sure is watching, um, for being so open uh, to what was said that she said at the time of the meeting that at this one she would amend or rescind, rather, uh, her motion. And thank you, Mr. McMillian, for going out with her to actually see that presentation. Ms. Jones. Thank you. I do want to thank um, the principal and the librarians, Ms. Magnus, especially from Kenwood High, that invited me to see the SERS research program in um, you know, how she used it in school, and I sat for an hour. So um, I encourage Mr. McMillian as well, and I'm glad that we are reversing this, uh, rescinding this uh, contract, so thank you. Any other discussion, Ms. Hen? Thank you. I, too, want to thank staff for providing the board with the data necessary to make this decision. I think it's very helpful. As you can see, we are using data to drive our decision making, so it's important that we complete data when we make the requests. We are not trying to make busy work for anybody. We actually are using the, the data that you provide us and it is very helpful. So thank you very much for providing that and having that complete picture is very helpful as well as receiving the testimony from our schools. So I wanna thank them as well. And I wanna thank my board members for your diligence in reviewing the information we receive and making such thoughtful decisions. Sometimes we'll get it right and sometimes we'll get it wrong, but I appreciate um, the conscientious efforts of Mr. McMillian and Ms. Mack in acknowledging the fact that we got this one wrong and the support that we're going to rescind this and do what's right by kids. We hear from our stakeholders all the time that we need to focus on people in our schools. So we are looking at every dollar that we put in this budget and questioning the opportunity cost of our investment in tools over people. So we want to make sure that the dollars we are spending on tools are really needed for kids because there is an opportunity cost there. So again, I will support this motion because it is a a useful tool and I thank staff for providing the justification for that. If I may just Ms. Causey, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, the board for giving us the opportunity to not only provide the data, but more importantly the context. Uh, Ms. Hen, you know I'm often um, have said information in the absence of context can lead to mis 
misunderstanding um, easily. And so we appreciate the opportunity to provide clear context. Um, and I offered at the curriculum committee, anytime you have questions about our resources, I and my team stand ready to answer and provide you information and context so that you have full understanding. So I likewise would like to express my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else before I call the vote? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Ms. Joes? I do have a motion. Um, I move that the Baltimore County Board of Education allocate $1 million to replace all faucets in all of the schools that are currently shut off because they tested between five parts per billion and 20 parts per billion of lead. Second. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. Last year, we made a motion to reduce our action level uh, of lead in school from 20 parts per billion to five parts per billion. That motion uh, carried unanimously by this board. Last week, I testified in the Maryland Senate Education and uh, Health and Environment Committee for the Safe School Drinking Water Act to implement this statewide in the state of Maryland. Uh, our current action level of 20 parts per billion in Maryland is inadequate. We know that low levels of lead um, is um, dangerous to children. It causes behavioral problems, slow growth, and hyperactivity. Lead is a heavy metal and it's a neurotoxin. It bioaccumulates in your body. Um, it is introduced in our water through aging infrastructure. And a budget should reflect our priorities and where we allocate our money matters. Um, we, um, over one billion people around the world do not have access to safe, clean drinking water. The United States is not one of them, neither should it be. Our kids should have safe drinking water in all of their schools. I spoke to Mr. Dixit and there's about a thousand faucets, more or less, that need to be replaced. Uh, our children should go in and have access to safe, clean drinking water every day, each day. And, um, as you can see, I'm very passionate about this as a water engineer. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Board members, questions, comments, discussion? Yeah. So we haven't had an update from, um, from buildings as, and Mr. Diggs, basically, as to where we stand. My understanding was all of those things were being replaced. Is that not the case? We welcome Mr. Dixit to the panel. Good evening. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. The motion was that the faucets be turned off. So that will be done. But this motion that uh, Ms. Molly has uh, indicated is replacement of that. Replacement cost anywhere from 500 to $700. So replacing those 870 some fixtures that are in the range of five to 20 part per billion, that's what is going to cost around a million dollars. So just so I'm clear again, we're talking about five to 20, and, and I applaud and I fully support this action. Um, I guess I thought we were in the process, I know we're in the process of testing and retesting and managing down, right? Yes. Um, to the action level yeah. and to the five parts per billion. Um, I, I wasn't aware we had no intention of replacing those faucets and water in the water supply. So is that, do we have no intention of replacing them? I'm Regulation is about 20 parts per billion and mm -hmm. above. Now that is going to be replaced, but from five to 20, there is no state regulation. They will, however, fund the project, or, or the project will be eligible for funding under a state's healthy school grant. But we had air conditioning as priority. So that's what was submitted. All right, thank you. We had Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Scott. Um, is there money in our current major maintenance account for that, or is this gonna be added to the major maintenance of the next CIP? Or will this be a special project? How will this how will this enter in, I guess? Major maintenance is part of the capital program mm -hmm. and that does not have any money for lead and water compliance. 
okay, so where in the operating budget will this go? The lead and water, it will go as part of the environmental office. Okay. It's, okay. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so as I understand this motion, I just wanted to uh, restate it. Uh, right now with the testing, there's um, fixtures that are, um, some are testing 20, some are testing five, some are testing, like I said before, really, really high, especially those in my area where there were ones that are testing like a thousand parts per billion. What this motion will do, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, will replace the fixtures and bring the levels down to zero as what was recommended by the EPA? Now, the EPA is not the right body. What we are talking about is state regulations. The state regulations are for 20 parts per billion and above. Mm -hmm. All of those fixtures are going to be replaced. The board's motion was between five and 20 parts per billion to turn them off. Since we have the results of testing, we know exactly what fixture is in between five to 20. Okay. We will turn it off. So all the schools are safe. I want to emphasize that every school has bottled water. Okay. okay. And then I guess my other question is, is, is also, when will the um, new testing um, be completed and the results posted on the website? The new testing for 20 parts per billion, uh, I don't have the date, but it'll be whatever we indicated before. I think you said April. And that'll be done. Okay, so, some, so I didn't know if we narrowed it down in April as to when it would be updated on the website. Uh, no, there is no one specific date. Okay. Yeah. And it's all updated at the same time Absolutely. in April. It's not like you'll do some as the results come in. It's at the same time. It's at the same time. Okay. And right now... Um, there's bottled water that's available. That has been available right from the beginning, even before the regulations came into being. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Do you have a number or no, if we're looking at, at, at any of the tests that were above zero, what the impact or what the number of those faucets and or water supplies are? We have test results of all of them. Right. The drinking sources. Right. My, my question is, is basically lead is bad in any amount for children. And we're driving down from the Maryland regulation at 20 to 5, which I support. My question is below 5, above 0. How, how large is how what is the magnitude of those water sources do you do you know i can get that number for you but what i can tell you zero is not even the requ zero is not even the requirement for the source of water so municipal levels are not zero okay so so the water that you'll be drinking at home might have more than zero I, all right, I, I understand that. I guess I would like to get to zero, if possible. And my question is really along those lines, how do we get there? And what is the impact for us? Because I, I truly, I applaud and I, I support the, the 20 to five, and that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm bringing it up now so that we have an understanding of the next step. What is the next step going to take, and what would it cost us? I, I don't know what that is. Yeah, and what we go by is the regulations and compliance with regulations, and obviously the board motion. So the board motion last time was that anything between 5 and 20, right, we I, are going to turn that off. And the regulation was 20 and above, and that has been done, or will be done by the end of April. So if there's another board motion for zero, there is always cost associated with it. So board has to look into uh, the research that is out there and what does it say about zero. Then board also has to look into that if zero, zero to five is allowed for the municipal, for the source of water, 
then should we be less than that? And what are the health consequences of that? What is the research out there? And, and Ms. Uh, Molly yeah. has me more knowledge about Ms. Joe wants that. to chime in on this. Mr. Kuhn, thank you. That's actually an excellent question on why didn't we just come down to zero. Um, the reasoning was that we are working with Maryland State to also bring that testing down from 20 to 5, which is why I'm again going to testify for the Safe Drinking Water Act. There is also a certain amount of variability when you test between 0 and 5, and it's really not um, going to be caught very accurately. So we just came to the 5 parts per billion, firstly because of fiscal impacts. Secondly, also I want to point out that when we do change these faucets, there is going to, we have a recurring cost of bottled water that the system is now incurring, which I believe would be hundreds of thousands of dollars, we're going to scale back on that and we're going to have more additional money available, which we could then go to those faucets that when we retest them if they have any more faucets. So it'll just be implemented in a more um, fiscally responsible manner. But you know, it's an excellent point. So, and EPA is currently, um, to your point, Mr. Um, Dixit, EPA is currently revising its lead and copper rule, and they are going to bring revise it down to a lower uh, level, just like um, from 20 parts per billion to f 15 and 10. So they are in the process of doing that as well. And I also want to point out that the water that you this is a public service announcement <laughs> that we get in our faucets is more heavily regulated than bottled water. Uh, pu public utilities test for over 20 contaminants, micro contaminants, microorganisms. Bottled water do not. So uh, it is much more safe for your tap water than bottled water. So thank you. Ms. Scott. So first, I wanted to. Um, Thank Molly for her diligence and her um, using her information and her professionalism and everything to help um, make sure that our children in BCPS have clean drinking water. I, I, I think that that's wonderful, and I think she's an asset to have a board member who is an engineer <laughs> who who can do that. So, um, especially for my community, where some of the highest levels of lead in water exists. So um, my question is, how much are we spending on bottled water? About a half million dollars a year. Half a million dollars? OK. And how much are, are was this, how much did you say it would cost to, to do this? Um, you said a million? Yes. So wow. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, a million dollars. <laughs> I just turned it off. Uh, yes, about a million dollars when we did the ballpark calculations. Again, that is variable depending on the fixtures. Some might be 500, some might be 1,000 based on uh, how you replace them. So it's a ballpark figure. Thank you. So the, um, so the calculation, Mr. Dixit, um, is you said 870 fixtures. 870 fixtures that are in between 5 and 20. Okay. Parts per billion and 20. Parts. Yes, so 870 fixtures that are covered in this motion. That's right. And then the cost would be between... It, it could be, it will vary from fixture to fixture, but for budgeting purposes, $500 to $700 for fixture. Okay, great. So a rough calculation would be $435,000 to $650,000? I believe it was a million dollar, close to a million dollar. Uh, let me check. Mr. McMillian. So it, uh, it's half a million dollars. Right. Yeah. <coughs> That's Excuse correct. me, Mr. Saris? Yeah. Uh, at I see you with your 870 calculator. times, I just picked $600 per fixture, would be 552000 OK, thank you. If and when all these fixtures would be replaced, are we then going to remove the bottled water? We haven't talked about that, but that's a possibility. Thank you. Ms. Rowe. So, uh, Mr. Dixit, how, how many of the schools that have bottled water have the bottled water strictly because of this problem with the lead? Or do we have situations where schools have bottled water for other plumbing reasons or lack of AC or w because I know at different times it was put in at different times and I'm just curious what the different circumstances are that result in schools getting bottled water. Okay. 
couple of years ago when there was a lot of talk about contaminated water, lead in water, and air conditioning related water issue, the board and the administration made a decision that we'll just provide bottled water for the abundance of precaution. We just provide bottled water to every student. And that's what we have been doing. Once this air clears out, once all the schools are air conditioned, once all of the testing is done, then we'll make a recommendation for superintendent's consideration. Thank you. Board members, any other questions or comments before we take a vote on the motion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Board members, other questions or comments? Ms. Hen. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. I move to amend the fiscal year 2021 budget by increasing the allocation for network support services by 125000 for contracted services by the Maryland Department of Information Technology to provide direction and support related to IT project and program management to successfully initiate, plan, execute, monitor, control, and close information technology projects that enable efficient, effective, and innovative services. Is there a second? Mr. Kuhn, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I would. Thank you. Um, the Department of Information Technology is a resource. As we look to, as the Network Support Services team um, takes on quite a heavy lift with nine million in IT projects this year, I want to make sure that they have the project management resources they need to be successful. This is a, a powerhouse of a group. And for um, 125000 compared to $9 million budget for these projects, this is a resource that will ensure that we are successful in implementing on these projects. Um, the Do It follows the SDLC, or System Development Lifecycle, providing project managers with a repeatable process to guide them through the various phases of project management for successful execution of IT projects to ensure that the projects are um, successful, that they are delivered on time and on budget. And again, my motion is aimed to provide our team with all the resources they need to be successful, and that is the goal of my motion. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn and then Ms. Joes, and then I have a comment. So I have a question. Uh, can we ask um, them to do it for free? They are, no. no okay. they, they provide this as a fee-based service to agencies and counties. Ms. Joes. I apologize if I didn't hear it. What's the fiscal impact of this? Uh, sure, 125,000. And uh, what, how is this different than, and I wasn't there for the um, redirecting the $121,000 from network support services to internal audit. Is that similar to the IT analysis, that, that motion that you did last um, board? Sure. This is, this is a more thoughtful motion that I'm replacing with the motion that I introduced last time. It's using a resource that I've, I've used personally in my career. Um, Do it has a team of portfolio managers and project managers that work with agencies and counties to provide an additional resource for, I, for complex IT portfolios. And considering that our team is taking on quite the heavy lift with projects this year, it's an aggressive plan. I want to ensure that they have all the resources they need to be successful. So this is a very focused, targeted um, ad, and it actually adds to their budget for contracted services by allowing them to make the use of Do It, um, which is a state resource for counties. So this is add on to the IT department? Correct. And uh, is there anybody from IT that um, could answer some of my questions? Is that um, something that was recommended in your strategic plan, in your uh, f um, planning this uh, impact of this network support services, or do we have the in-house ability to do it? And uh, what are the impacts of this? So, Mr. Jones, we've just finished our uh, um, initial uh, legislative audit sweep that uh, is based on the Maryland State Department of IT's uh, recommendations for all um, offices of the state, which include all state school systems. Um, 
So we have um, in-house project management. Um, Do it provides um, support through a uh, state CIO user group that uh, has um, been established uh, by uh, several CIOs in other counties um, as a nonprofit. Um, in this motion. Um, we would be able to facilitate usage of, of do it services um, for any of the, the needs we would have. I, I don't see where it would be a, a, an issue for us to be able to engage them as consultants. So we currently don't have the ability to do that independently or in-house? Well, we have, we have project managements that follow uh, life cycle development. Um, we have uh, two full-time staff members and um, I, I want to say there's about three or four that we've contracted with that we put on big projects. So, um, I mean, I don't know that it would necessarily be um, directly needed, but we could utilize it if it was put in place. So you're not making a strong recommendation for me. This is taxpayers' dollars, so I need to know, is it something you want? Like Ms. Ben said, that there is a need, there's heavy lift, this project's coming. If you need it, then it's something this board would would consider if it's not needed it's just something it's a redirect of the motion from last uh, two weeks ago um, then i also need to know that i, I just need to be clear so mrs joseph quite, quite honestly if, if there was a service that we needed to put in place to utilize this for um at one hundred twenty thousand dollars or whatever that hourly rate would be we would have subsumed it within the budget as well so you answered my question if Sorry. So if you would have needed, if the IT department needed it, you would have put that in the budget, in Dr. Williams' budget. Is that correct, Dr. Williams? If it was a... Yes, that is, that is correct. Um, thank you, Mr. Corns, um, for trying to give uh, additional information, whether it's needed or not. And I think that's what Board Member Jokes was trying to say. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? That was actually me. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. McMillian was first and then Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Mr. Corns answered my questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Rowe. Mr. Corns, is there anything that the school system um, currently has in-house capacity for that we're using through another vendor that utilizing this would cost less than what we're currently paying? Not that I'm aware of, Ms. Rowe. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hen. Mr. Corns, have you worked side by side with a do it portfolio manager in your career? I have. You have. And how was that experience? Can you speak to that in uh, terms the, of the value? The the last interaction we had with uh, a do it um, individual, uh, the county that I was in did not receive a lot of gain from that experience. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Williams. So I think the question might be, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And if there are issues, which I'm not aware of through this department, this might be something that we may want to pursue down the road. Um, so, I, so I just want to pose that at this time. I'm not quite sure what the problem we're trying to solve and if there's data to say this is an area we need to pursue, this was not presented, and my team can correct me, this was not presented when we started with the development of the budget. Um, it may be something that we pursue down the road another year from now as we look at all of our technology and the work. But at this time, I think that's probably a little bit of the hesitation um, that came from staff. Ms. Hen. Thank you. So I think with any consultant, the value that can be derived depends on the consultant, whether that's a state consultant or a private agency. Much depends on the individual that you're working with. I've had positive experiences with consultants and quite the opposite experience in on IT projects, both of small um, projects and much larger projects, as I'm sure Mr. Corns has had um, similar experiences. Um, the crux of my motion, again, is to try to provide resources that we may not know we need at this point. And again, we are taking on quite the heavy lift. Um, we have quite the large request with an additional $9 million. That's not change, pocket change, with the projects that 
this group is taking on that we have may have needs not to say we haven't planned for those needs but i have worked with do it and they have provided value that we didn't know we needed until we were in the crux of working with them and for 125,000 to keep these projects on schedule. I requested information that I was not given in terms of project schedules, in terms of project start and end dates that were not provided. And my question is why, why wasn't the board provided that information? Do we have the adequate project management resources? When I hear that we have two project managers and we're taking on 9 million in IT projects, that's a huge concern to me. So yes, I, I believe we need more resources. I think our project management resources are inadequate, and I believe DOIT has the staff and capacity to assist us. So I continue to support this motion. I think we needed to beef up our project management in this area, and I think it would be foolish to approve $9 million in additional project management expenditures without giving this group more help. Mr. Kuhn. So, um, when you were discussing the project management resources at your disposal currently, you said I think you have two people on staff yes. and maybe four other people you're contracting with. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm looking at the, um, the Business Services Executive Director of Information Technology, page 204, and I see that there's $420,000 of contracted services there. Is that, does that cover th those? Um, those additional resources for project management, or is that somewhere else? Mr. Coon, if I were to, um, if I were to direct you to page 205 on project management, we have an allocated budget in the FY20 budget for $643,000 in contracted services, which is our incremental um, uh, allotment for swinging in um, temporary project managers to cover uh, resource uh, needs when we do a project. Um, in the FY19 budget, uh, we utilized about $200,000 of that for projects that needed to be assigned. So if, if part of this request were to be to utilize do it at $120,000, I believe we could subsume that within the current expenditures of the project management office without increasing Dr. Williams' budget. Okay, so, so thank you for pointing me to the next page. Sure, <laughs> no worries. Um, and, and that is a significant increase in spend, and, and if that is specifically for project management support that you are expecting to need. We, we have it in place when we're ready for it. Okay. All right. Mr. Corns, you said you have it in place already, so that service is being contracted out. M Mr. Jones, we've, we've added project management resources to projects that have uh, warranted them. Correct, so th how does this motion help you? I need to know that you're the IT person, the IT guru, we are not. So I need to hear clearly from you, just like we need to hear from the teachers, from Dr. Williams, what the teachers need. I need to know from you if, if this motion, you need this additional money or not, or you already have it in the budget, then I'm going to vote no on this motion. Ms. Joes, I have this money in the budget. If, if Ms. Hen's request is that we utilize $125,000 of this funding to work with Do It, then I am certainly happy to do that. Ms. Hen? Then I would withdraw my motion then and amend it to um, direct um, network services to use 125,000 of this allocation to work with do it. I'm just going to take a point of order here, Mr. Nussbaum. Do I need to get the, the person that seconded it to agree? I need to get the person that seconded it to agree to withdraw and the um, and then approve the second motion. Was that you, Ms. Rowe? No. Mr. Kuhn, do you accept the withdrawal? I accept the withdrawal. Okay. So you modified your motion? I modified my motion, and I'll restate my motion. Thank you. So, so just a question, uh, and it's just my wondering. I know the board really, uh, I view as governance. I'm, I'm just... We seem to be teetering on a, a on an operational decision. So, I need a more a little more clarity. Sure, absolutely. 
if we are being asked to approve a $9 million increase in projects for network support services, there needs to be a subsequent increase in oversight. And do it will provide that level of oversight that I'm seeking with my approval. Okay. Ms. Rowe? Um, do we have a motion on the floor or no? I'm he was about to restate, restate it restate and then. I think that. <coughs> I'm Ms. Not Rowe, sure we're, we're in the middle of restating a motion, okay. and then we're going to see if we get a second, and then we, we can have further discussion. So let's, we'll just do one thing at a time. Ms. Hen. And I may need some guidance from council in reworking this motion, if I may. Mr. Nussbaum. In reallocating. Wait, are you following the motion? Okay. Just in wording of this motion. To amend the um, budget by reallocating 125000 for contracted services for um, to work specifically with Maryland Department of Information Technology to provide direction and support related to IT and project and program management. I, kn I know you're in the midst of rephrasing there, there's also purchasing implications uh as it relates to identifying identifying a specific vendor without going through the appropriate process as Okay. In terms of procurement law as a state agency, the, this would not require a competitive procurement to use do its services um, in this manner. And I'm looking at Mr. Saris. So uh, just want to remind the board that we have a contract with 58 vendors to provide IT consulting services. And we select from them, we interview candidates from from those providers and we hire them on for short or longer term projects um, Are they the uh, this vendor I don't believe is on that list um, we would uh, it's possible that under cooperative administration of programs that this vendor might be appropriately hired um, but we would still have to come back to the board with a contract exhibit to uh, that my purchasing staff have reviewed and verified like we do with all other cooperative contracts to present for a separate vote. Is the motion ask done? Dr. Williams, then, for a recommendation in terms of implementing the board's. The mic. Get your mic on. My mic is on. Dr. Williams, do you have a recommendation then in terms of implementing this motion? Or well, I want to. Structuring this motion? Yes, I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Scriven because identifying a particular company I think is causing some of the concerns. The, the issue, and I think Mr. Korn said it, to allow us to use the funds that are in the budget to look at, and, you, and you're going to have to help, we're going to need help with that motion. We just got to take out that name for us to explore what other options are out there. And Mr. Sayers just recognized we need to go back and make sure that do it is a part, if I'm saying it right, a part of our... Um, well, it's either part of our existing contract or it meets the criteria for a cooperative administration of programs, or the board does have the authority under state law to name a vendor as a sole source provider. I don't think this provider would qualify, but I'd have to research it further, as I said, and have my staff look at it. It does. As a, as a state agency, it does. Is the motion done? 
Uh, so, you know, thank you, Dr. Scrivens, for pointing that out. At what point do we go from governance to actually sitting and running the system? Uh, I'm really going to bank on you guys to tell me what what you need for me to vote. So it looks like it's already in the budget. I'm not comfortable uh, naming a vendor. That would be to, to really dummy it down to say, I can provide the lead uh, testing services, which I probably could, but I couldn't do that because I'm now recommending somebody. And um, I don't think it's ethical for me to recommend. I recommend AYZ do all of the testing. I just gave you the direction, go in and change the faucets. I'm not telling you what contractor to use, what services to use. That would be outside my purview as you guys are the experts. You tell me the vendors bring in the list. So I'm not comfortable with, um, with naming a vendor. That, that's where I'm so. I, I'm not sure. I do realize we need that service, and it's in the budget. Dr. Williams has done a great job with the budget, and um, I, I'm not comfortable adding one more service to it. We're already 13% over MOE. So unless you guys specifically tell me, and I really think there's some kind of procurement things where I, I don't want to name a vendor in a, a motion. I wouldn't be comfortable. So Ms. Hen's going to restate that she had withdrawn her motion, got a second to withdraw restating a new motion. So I would move that the board ask Dr. Williams to bring forth options for a third party independent contractor to provide program management services to the network support services team. Um, I'm sorry, there's, I'll restate that. I move that the board ask Dr. Williams to um, bring to the board recommendations for third party independent contractors to provide um, project management services to the IT group to implement, to assist with network support services projects. Is there a second? Andy, how do you Mr. Newsbaum. I'm not trying to cause a problem, but I'm not sure how that relates to the budget. It's directly it's not, related it's to the discussion. Budget. You're not amending the budget. It's a separate. So the but. It's a separate motion. It's probably not right. So the. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Newsbaum. So the budget book is 300 pages, and what the that's the student council. So what the board is voting on is all of those. So this would be an amendment to the budget, a request to Dr. Williams, to utilize some of those resources, uh, according to her motion. So there's been other motions. Uh, made around the budget, even in terms of correcting test scores on pages. So um, it would be appropriate to, to have that. So you had your motion. Was there a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? I think Ms. Rowe. There's so many reasons we can't do this now. Because the amount of information that we need to be able to engage in this kind of discussion and the procurement issues and the different things, I would really rather than deal with a motion like this right now, just ask the superintendent and staff to come back to us with more information and questions about it and deal with this as a separate agenda item if we want to look at this, because I understand and I appreciate Ms. Hen's concerns and why she's making this motion and to look at the fiscal impact of decisions and make sure that we're using money the best way. And I really, I appreciate that. I just think that it needs a more exhaustive look and a deeper dive into it. So, yes, Ms. Hen. I, I agree, agree with Ms. Rowe and I will withdraw my motion because I agree it needs a, a dedicated discussion and my concerns are on the record. I am uncomfortable approving this specific line item without additional oversight and without providing additional program management resources to this team. So I will request that it be added to an agenda for um, future discussion. It sounds like there are resources already in the budget for um, program management resources, and I would like to see them, um, the use of do it, be um, given strong consideration by this board. So I was the second, so I will agree to the withdrawal and just um, say that as your role as chair of buildings and contracts to um, work with Dr. Williams and staff to have that brought forward in buildings and contracts. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, board members, questions, comments? Ms. Rowe. So Rod had Lisa's motion. I have Lisa's budget questions. <laughs> um, she's sick, so she couldn't be here. Um, so in the last budget work session, staff was asked why 58 school counselors were shown as other on page 114 in the budget book. And staff responded on 221 that 58 would be more appropriately labeled as 30 additional counselors for in elementary school, 9.6 additional counselors in middle school, and 17.4 additional counselors in high school. And there are several questions related to that. Um, why were the 58 shown? I'll read all the questions and then you can just cover the whole topic. Why were the 58 shown in other in the initial proposed budget book? Why were they not shown in the individual school counselor count at the elementary school, middle school, and high school level? Have these 58 school counselors been in their respective schools all year or were these 58 reassigned just recently reassigned as a result of the initial question? And um, is there confirmation that the 10 additional school counselors proposed in this budget will be in addition to the 58 that were classified initially as other? I'll take that one. Okay, thanks. Um, the reason they were listed as other was uh, really, uh, and it, there was an historical reason why some counselors got booked there and then um, it, it really, they should have been at the, in the following year. So when we got counselors and weren't sure where they were going, they got put into other. That had no impact on where they were actually allocated by human resources in the schools. But they got stacked up for a few years. And I'll, I'm just going to call it an oversight in how they were listed in the budget book. It had nothing to do with the schools they were actually assigned to. They were just noted incorrectly in the budget book. That's yeah. really the most straightforward explanation. So the one that's in e-learning is the only one that is truly in other. OK, so and the 10 additional school counselors in this budget book, they're in addition to the 58? Uh, they're, they were in that group. They were in the in That's budget, where they the were held group. in that edition of the budget book, but they'll be obviously put into schools at, in whatever grade level they're needed. Okay, so in the budget book, there were 48 and we're adding 10 to 58, or there'll be 68? The 10 are in that They're number. embedded in that 58. Yes. Okay, so the other question or class of questions is, so the class flow contract. The contract for class flow, which began in January 2015 and expired 13120, had a total expenditure of 2,767,991,000, which was 12,000 over the spending authority. This equates to an annual expenditure of approximately 553,000 per year. However, information provided in the February 21 budget Q&A shows an annual expenditure of 147,000. And I'll ask the questions and you can cover the whole issue. Why did we pay 640,000 in FY19 expenditures for something we are now saying costs 147,000? And um, could we have saved 2,027,991,000 over five years? What, it, what precipitated this reduction, and when specifically was the reduction negotiated? So let me answer that, uh, Ms. Rowe. That uh, contract spending that you're referring to is for multiple products. Mm -hmm. The one, one product cited, which is the class flow, is just part of that total spending. And so, um, we are paying the price as stated for that one product, and there are a variety of other products purchased under that same contract. So, okay, now. Ms. Rowe, may I ask a dovetailing question? Sure. So, for the additional 2.5 uh, million or whatever it is, what are those other products, and was that usage provided in? Um, the charts for the board? Um, well, so some of the products Mr. would Embryale be. Mr. Embriali would like to help. Help, is that okay? okay. Hi, George. 
Good evening, um, Mr. Embriali. Thank the, you. The 147,000 is the renegotiated cost working with Promethean for class flow. So we um, we presented on this topic last Thursday evening at the curriculum committee and talked a little bit about the uh, working to reduce our costs wherever we can where, wherever we can find those reductions and working with our um, uh, the vendors that we use to find where those reductions can be made. So class flow is one of those products. Class flow, the other product that's associated with that larger figure, I think it was a $600,000 figure, if that's correct, Ms. Rowe, yes. um, was also Active Inspire. So Promethean has two products, Class Flow and Active Inspire. Active Inspire uh, and Class Flow are really essentially the exact same product. One is installed on a computer, the other is a um, cloud-based product. As we've transitioned to the Chromebooks, we're shifting the product from Active Inspire to Class Flow, and that is significantly reducing our cost. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand this. It's actually the transition from Chromebooks where essentially switching products to a cheaper product. It's the same company. Same company. Different. It is the same core functionality. Mm -hmm. One was installed mm -hmm. on a product and the other is cloud-based. It is essentially the same product. Okay. There are there are some minor nuances, but it's essentially the same product. It, it provides students and teachers the same ability. Okay, so we're discontinuing the use of one as we phase into the other cheaper one. We're, we're transitioning. Okay. Uh, all of our teachers will always have access to Active Inspire on their Windows-based products that they have. Mm -hmm. All of our students will have access to Classflow. Teachers also have access to Classflow. But with that change, we were able to renegotiate okay. with Promethean in order to lower the cost of the product for the system. So did we used to have the Active Point of Inspire? order, Ms. Causey. Is, is this line of questioning something that should have been asked during your two by twos because you're wasting the board's time? And is that something that's excuse gonna change me, the budget? Excuse me, we're not going to um, state that a board member is wasting time. We are having thoughtful discussion. We These discussions should not be had during the budget. Uh, this is not relevant. You should have had it before. Actually, this information is being discussed because when the board members previously asked for usage data, we did not receive complete answers. So this is absolutely the correct time to have this conversation. So Ms. Rowe, you may continue. So I've lost my train of thought, but so basically um, we used to, did all the students used to have active flow and then now we're switching the students over to class flow? Uh, all of the, all of our students had, have or had access to Active Inspire. Inspire That's the installed okay. product that goes on a Windows computer. You can't install products on a, on a Chromebook. Right. So we had to look for an alternative and the company who provides Active Inspire has a essentially a one-to-one -one alternative that's a cloud-based product, which is ClassFlow. Okay, thank you. So I would just like to ask a question related to Ms. Ms. Rowe's discussion and some comments made about uh, renegotiating. So does the board need to make a recommendation that, you, that staff renegotiate every uh, contract that was procured non-competitively so that we can try and recoup additional saving, savings in other regards? Well, we negotiate every contract and virtually every contract is obtained competitively. Well, the, for the uh, instructional materials are not necessarily procured competitively. Not completely, no, they're procured on basis of best value, which is a combination of do they meet our instructional needs and relative to the other sources available, are they competitively priced? Ms. Okay. Causey. I, yes, Mr. Imbriali. I can simply tell you that any t in the Promethean contract with the Active Inspiring Class Flow, that was a five-year agreement. That agreement was, was coming up and we um, like we do with any kind of cycle like that, ensure that we're getting 
what the market rate should be for whatever that product is that we're using in our ecosystem. And we also ensure that we're auditing whether or not the product should stay in our ecosystem. Is it getting the kind of usage that we need to remain? Um, we've, I, I know we don't bring these things to the board because, um, because you all don't actually, we don't ask to take things away, but over the course of uh, the last five years, we've decommissioned 19 products. So we do continue to look at what we're using, what we're not using, and the cost of those products. So what I would like to suggest, and I'll ask um, for uh, Julie Hen as the chair of buildings and contracts, and Dr. Williams, if we can have an evaluation of those exact sorts of things. Because if we can look at history and understand that the boards, previous boards, have uh, procured products that have not been used and have been decommissioned, we absolutely need to understand those trends from the past in order to make better decisions. Just as we made decisions based on usage data to bring back instructional materials, we also want to be as as completely prudent as we can in every dollar that we're spending. We're, we're trying to add money to provide clean water. We are hearing from every stakeholder about our teachers needing support and smaller class sizes. We cannot waste a single dollar. So I'm just going to ask if that, if you can add that to your charge. So Ms. Yes. Cause, I'd also like to add that at the curriculum committee, uh, we discussed the fact that we do, in fact, uh, review and decide what products to keep, which ones we're getting a return on investment on as well. And that, as Mr. Imbriali said, they don't come forward because we are eliminating them. Um, so Ms. Mack had asked if, they, if you could have information on when that. And I said to her that an annual report would be a because it's not like every 30 days or 90 days we're looking at that because these are annual subscriptions so it's an annual process so I certainly can share uh, our process and our review as we do that uh, to keep you um, informed so that was something we discussed at curriculum committee as well so of course before we look at contracts we always look at what is the educational use and is it meeting a need in the system educationally so I offer that as well for everyone's thinking Thank you. Um, and I would um, add to Ms. Causey's comment that when contracts come before the board for products, if those products are replacing existing products that have been decommissioned, that's helpful information for the contracts committee to have. So rather than being added to our suite of products that we purchase, if it is replacing another product, that's useful for the contracts committee and board to know. So it may be and maybe that annual um, renewal hasn't come up, Dr. McComas, but if that's the plan when they come out of curriculum committee that product Y is replacing product X, if that's your plan at the time and you know that's the plan, that's helpful information for the contracts committee to have when we're evaluating a new product for consideration of a contract award. Thank you, and I just ask again that um, Excuse me. Excuse so let me, me. Let me just interject something. So this this topic may be helpful when we're talking about the board committees and the expectations about what's reported out in board committees um, during the meetings, what's shared during the board meetings in terms of updates, what kind of yearly reports that we can provide. I want to ensure the board, when we sat down and built this budget, I looked at everything possible everything possible, but the mere fact I knew we couldn't strip everything from the system because it was impacting programs and could potentially impact students and teachers. So I would just offer that this discussion about updates and yearly reports that we look at when we come together and talk about the roles of committees and expectations and what our staff can provide either on a monthly basis or a yearly basis. Thank you. I'm going to call a five-minute recess. Uh, there's a couple more items that we need to go through, and we all need a brain break and a stretch. So five minutes, and we'll be back. Thank you. 
Is this something that you want to be discussed on the one first quarter of the year? Uh, oh, not now. <laughs> so, uh, I have the exhibit, and I was going to add at least one of the other products. I can add the whole based on what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm going to add everything you want, and uh, it's not going to avoid this discussion. No, no. Yeah, it's at least if they, don't, if they want to start killing products, you know, so be it. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start trying to get this information front-loaded to me so that I can digest it and be the voice to kind of push back So these are those biases that exist. That, I mean, but, but even this one, this is, this is a freaking Ryan and reality issue. It has nothing really to do with services that are provided. So with them, George, unfortunately, which makes more of a did you see me with as much information to, to show the rationale. We're going to have the team with C and I to, to, to prep for this prior to coming to March time. So, that, that doesn't carry the impact they get out of that. So I'm, so I'm going to put together all the vendors, I'm going to send out the same eye and Next meeting, you guys are going to have to raise the money and we need these and what we do. I have a list. Okay. <laughs> Be a lot of work. Remember, I said there's some things that you want to say. Like, I'm going to let the acting chief respond. I think that's a No, what you said is flow.
two big ones on today. Did you know when you came back?
Thank you. You know, I was talking Oh, man. Team, we're going to get started. My guy. Oh, wait, over. Do you want me to? She's going to support what we recommend. I just want you to know that's yeah. happening. And there's one more topic that she wants to raise. The figures that Dr. Chang <laughs> is out there are not the full. I now call the board meeting back in session from recess. So we are still in item K, unfinished business, proposed fiscal year 2021 operating budget. And I had um, an issue that has been brought to our attention at the board by a number of emails and uh, communications related to the library media special specialists where there's two resource teachers, one for secondary uh, library media resource and one for elementary library media resource. And so my question related to that, which I had sent to Dr. Williams and he said staff would be prepared to answer this evening, is how is the school system going to uh, provide the report, the support that these two specialists have um, utilized their expertise to provide uh, to the 175 school library resource. Yeah, so thank you, Ms. Causey. I'm prepared to answer that. So as you know, we um, reduced the number of central office resource teachers to return those positions to schools to support um, school staffing. Um, and so we are readjusting our support model um, in all the areas that experience reductions. Library and media program is one of those areas. Still remaining in the library media program to provide support for all our library media programs uh, will be a coordinator, a specialist, a facilitator, a library media assistant, a clerk who helps manage the collection data, um, as well as an admin assistant secretary, um, as well as two resource teachers within the Department of Innovation. And so we are reconfiguring the resource teachers that we have left, um, and, and two of the remaining resource teachers in that department are certified and experienced library media specialists who will then pick up that support load. Um, so I'll just uh, reiterate that the um, library uh, media program will still have uh, seven, excuse me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight professionals to support the program. Their program needs involve uh, managing the library collection, uh, overseeing um, and managing and weeding out digital resources, as we've discussed, uh, managing the TV studio um, locate in our schools and, of course, curriculum development that happens in the summer with uh, school librarians who are then paid to help develop that curriculum in the summertime. So that is really our adjustment plan. So we're working uh, smarter and leaner, um, using people in uh, versatile capacities based on certification and experience. Thank you. And it's my understanding that, the, uh, that uh, these two specialists um, 
they've gained a lot of expertise in this area. So is there a priority given to um, them seeking another position in the school system that will properly utilize all of that expertise? So the, um, professionals who will have to go through the priority teacher uh, transfer process, and that is a standardized HR process. Certainly all of our professionals um, will be uh, in positions that align with their certification and experience. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing that I wanted to um, address is in the audit committee um, that we had last week, we had the Office of Food, Nutrition, and Services uh, present a very comprehensive report. Um, Dr. Williams has uh, stated that we're going to attach this to board docs so that it will be uh, attached to this meeting's minutes so that uh, folks can read it because it is um, it does impact the operating budget. So it's raising the bar and closing the gaps, meeting the nutritional needs of students. And I just want to point out that last year this board showed its dedication to providing nutrition for students through additional funding that we asked to be provided. Um, I will say that in this very extensive presentation um, and the report, like I said, will be attached and at a future meeting we're hoping to have um, them come present it and then all board members can ask questions, but also this report was attached to Friday weekly update. But because of the extensive research and the calculations that were provided in here, and they talked about the BCPS CEP pilot, pilot summary, but they also talked about the additional tools that we now have to provide nutrition. So I just wanted to state that this board does have a priority, has shown a priority to providing nutrition for children. Um, and I, I really believe after hearing this presentation and looking through the report with all of the numbers that in our operating budget, Dr. Williams has aligned resources to uh, take care of our children. So I just wanted to state that. I know that we have advocates here and that have come over the years really trying to help us focus on our children in poverty um, or food insecurity that need food. Because as we know, Maslow's Law, if their basic needs aren't met, it's going to be very hard for them to focus. So I did just want to state that, that we are, we hear everyone's concerns, and it was a very comprehensive report. So I appreciate Dr. Williams having staff prepare that for us ahead of the final uh, budget vote. Um, if anyone had any questions or comments about that. Ms. Jose? Thank you. I did have the opportunity to look through that. Um, presentation. It was very well done and Ashley would like that to come to the full board. It's very informative and it's, it's about what BCPS does for our children to feed them as every child should be and um, I really would look forward to everybody on the board. The audit committee got an opportunity to look at that and it was very well put together. Um, with that said, I would like to have a motion. Is, are you, I, have a, I do have a motion. Is, Certainly. I move that the Baltimore County Board of Education um, move or approve the fiscal year 2021 operating budget with the changes as the board has um, stated. Is there a second? Is there uh, any additional discussion? Ms. Pasteur? I just a um, quick one in that I, I want to thank the staff and Dr. Williams for um, just the very salient pieces that are in this budget that go to professional development on all levels, making sure that when we say, which we've been saying for a long time, and, and it has not been true, that all means all. It hasn't always meant that. Um, but I do believe that with the staff we have and the way they're working under your direction, that not only will it mean that um, just in terms of the words, but it goes to what is happening in our schools. So I see it in the budget, and I appreciate that, particularly that professional development. To piggyback on what Ms. Causey just said, um, and the string that Ms. Um, Joes just said late. I just want to thank those who've been advocating for proper nutrition, because with all that we have in this budget, it just doesn't happen if our children 
don't feel good about themselves. And the way I've seen it done um, in some schools that maintain for children their dignity and self-respect. And that's what I see in this budget, that kind of dignity, not just for the children, but what we're giving our staff members. And let's just call this also my board comments, okay? Uh, so we won't come back and revisit this party. <laughs> but um, I just really think that this is, this is a budget that can has the potential to speak to and pull us back to where we used to be, where we take care of our children and we start looking at those things that make our teachers want to come and want to stay. Board comments and my comments on the motion. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Williams and staff this is a gargantuan effort. And as much time as board members spent on the budget, I can't even imagine how much time staff spent on preparing it. So um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for all the effort you put into it. When I first had a conversation with Dr. Williams about the budget, he said, don't worry, it's in there. And he was true to his words. Um, with very few exceptions, it's in there. And that, that held true. So I know um, we asked a lot of questions. We put, um, certainly put staff through, through your paces with asking for information. Um, but again, I think it speaks to our commitment as a board to make the most of every dollar for our taxpayers, for our students. And you, know, you can only stretch a dollar so far. It's clear to me, especially this year more than ever, how much more we need. Um, but certainly it's in there and we need more of it in there, but this is a fine budget um, for Dr. Williams first year. It's an exemplary budget and it speaks to an exemplary staff. So thank you all for all your hard work. Ms. Rowe. It was a number of years ago, Senator Collins was on the board and he chastised the entire board that no one on the board, including himself, understood the budget or the budget process or anything about the budget. And he said this a number of years in a row. And I think sitting here today that we have come a very long way to understand the budget, have the board and the community engaging in the budget. And I appreciate staff and all of their diligence in helping the board to understand the budget so that the public can understand the budget. Because I understand that the staff in the school system understand the budget, but if the board doesn't understand the budget and if the community doesn't understand the budget and if we can't make informed decisions about the budget that the community can be on board with, then we're not acting as a community. And so I appreciate what it takes for staff to be able to inform the board so that we can make informed decisions and the patience that this entire process takes for the board members, the staff, the superintendent, the community, everyone. Um, so thank you. I, I don't think Senator Collins would say the same thing if he were sitting on this board. Thank you. Any other comments, board members? Okay, um, just before I call the vote, I just want to say this is my fifth budget cycle, and I am just truly impressed with Dr. Williams and his staff bringing us the budget and everything that the board members have done to examine it and all of the um, back and forth and the discussion. It's really been wonderful. Um, I am so glad to see that we are right-sizing our technology budget uh, because that, that was skewed in the wrong direction and we have too many needs uh, that go unmet, unmet. And so I'm really glad to see that and um, that that work will continue. We are trying to provide for the needs of the children clean air, clean water, food, the support staff to support the teachers. We really want this to work, and we want it to work right now. We're, we're all very dedicated and trying to make improvements. I really appreciate Dr. Williams um, and his collaboration with us, and that that collaboration will continue as we um, find out how much funding that we're going to get. Um, so. Again, we appreciate everyone's work. We, as, I, as Ms. Pasteur said, we appreciate all the advocates that have been really uh, in the trenches advocating for children in so many ways. Um, so with that said, anything else? All in favor? 
The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, team, for your hard work. Appreciate it. And for the stakeholders and unions and other central office staff, thank you for your patience for these work sessions on the budget. Thank you. So the next item on the uh, the next item on the agenda is item L, board comments, and also committee updates. So what we're going to do is just go around the room, and Miss Rowe will start with you. So I just want to say I attended the. Uh, school system side by side, and previously I attended uh, attended the choreography um, exhibit, and I really appreciate our arts program in the school system. Our our arts staff do such a fantastic job, and more and more I find I talk to parents that when I was in school, you could not become proficient in an instrument in the school system I was in or anything else without private lessons on top of anything your school offered, which was almost nothing. And we have a school system that offers so much more in the form of arts than even other school systems that our school system, a child can enter our school system with no skills gain all of those skills in our school system and act and if they have the drive and the desire and the practice go on to a full-time career in an arts profession and that is not something that very many public school systems can brag about but we can brag about that and I really appreciate that for my three kids who play instruments but I really love seeing that we just have this breadth of arts program because one of the things that the study about childhood trauma is proving is that creativity and furthering creativity creates resiliency against the effects of trauma. So to the degree that we have students who struggle with trauma, that we can impart creative programs and arts programs into their lives to that degree, they will be able to survive their trauma better and have better outcomes in their life. And so the, we should never, in any budget process or anything else, ever think about defunding arts programs or anything like that. And I'm very proud of our arts programs in this school system. And we have to just keep doing this. Thank you. Ms. Scott. Thank you. Um, so I'll just give an update. Earlier this month, um, I had the opportunity to attend the National School Boards Association 2020 Advocacy Institute, as well as the Equity Conference. Um, it's attended by board members from across the United States, where we learned about America's public schools, bridging the digital divide, and learning while gaining um, valuable insights on policies pr and practices that will benefit public schools and students. And I just wanted to share with everyone that Baltimore County Public Schools were well represented it during an innovative learning forum panel titled Champion Our Children. And the students representing Baltimore County Schools were um, from various schools, Chesapeake High School, Eastern Technical High School, Delaney High School, and our very own BCPS board member, Omar Rashid, who attended, who attends <laughs> Bikesville High. And um, they, did a, they did a wonderful job. And um, they were um, very well versed in the subject area. They spoke well. And I received a lot of feedback from uh, board members from all over the United States who were telling me, wow, are these really your children in Baltimore County? That's very impressive. We were very impressed with um, your children and, and what they said and how they learned. And people just kept coming over to me. So I thought that was important um, to share. So I'd also um, like to acknowledge the work of the students at Lock Raven Technical Academy and their work with the Lynching Memorial Project. Um, I find it fascinating. Students are researching the life and death of Howard Cooper, a 15-year-old teenager who was lynched in Towson in 1885. And this is part of um, all grade eight um, BCPS students will participate in a civic action project. And at Lock Raven, um, this is their um, civic action project. And I had the great opportunity to attend um, the presentation from historian Jennifer Lals of the Lynching Project and to hear from the students what this meant, how they felt, and to hear the connectivity that the students felt connected to this 15-year-old and who lived in Towson just like, just like they do. So that was um, really, I appreciate the opportunity to learn. And I'd like to also 
um, congratulate Mr. Kenneth Burlett Jr. at Milford Mill Academy for being one of only eight school counselors in Maryland to be honored by the 2020 College Board Counselors Recognition Program. Um, Principal Kira Joseph said that she nominated him because he's gone the extra mile for college and career opportunities for all BCPS seniors, and that's very important. And um, lastly, because there's so many wonderful things going on right now at BCPS, I don't know if everybody knows that, but I'm here to share the good news, so um, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Um, I'd also, um, like Ms. Kira also said, at Milford Mill during the last four years has almost doubled its graduating seniors' four-year college acceptance rate. And that's important. Yes, and that's attributed directly to Mr. Bertlett and to Principal Joseph for all their work and leadership in this area. And this is truly equity in action and truly speaks to our commitment to create safe, caring, and mutual, respectful environment within our school district and our community so that our students and families and uh, everyone feels welcomed. And I'd also like to thank the students and Principal Anderson at Eastern Technical High School for allowing me to participate in their annual cultural coalescence, which enables students to enlighten their fellow students about diversity and celebrate cultures from all over the world. In this one school, they have 52 different cultures. That was amazing. And all of the students had booths. And I visited each and every booth. And all of them had food. And that was interesting, to because I, I also ate at each and every booth. Um, and I was able to surprise the children that I had heard of the Punjabi MCs out of India who did a remix with Jay-Z, also known as Hova. And everybody stopped and looked at me, you know Jay-Z? So, <laughs> so, and lastly, I visited, also the principal knows who Chance the Rapper is also. So we, you know. Um, and then lastly, I visited Randallstown High School for the sixth annual and last Randallstown High Journey Through Time, where it was living history where the children dressed up as African Americans from, um, I guess, maybe the 60s and 70s and prominent figures of yesteryear. So this was wonderful. It was, it was covered by um, Channel 2. I understand the superintendent went, and I came after you all because I wanted to be there for the finale, and it was just wonderful, and I would like to congratulate the uh, principal there, um, Principal Brown, and also Miss Susan Ellerby for all of their hard work. So thank you all. Mr. McMillian. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend four uh, school-related events in, the, in recent weeks. The first one was the student choreography showcase in Patapsco. Miss uh, Rowe was there. We were attending together. There were 32 dance teams on Thursday, February 6th competing. They weren't really competing against each other. They were performing. Uh, the second event was the Aviation Technology Ribbon Cutting Ceremony at Kenwood on Thursday, February 20th. The third one was uh, Chesapeake, I traveled with Chesapeake High School Business Department to the Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C. for two sports marketing sessions and watched the Washington Wizards. That was on Friday, February 21st. And then Saturday morning, uh, February 22nd, I went to Lock Raven High School for the Black Saga competition where there were 20 teams from the elementary and middle schools uh, competing each other for awards. And that is the part of this job that I like, is getting out, interacting acting with the kids in the schools and and <laughs> that's the wonderful piece of this thank you miss Joes. thank you um, a few weekends ago some of the board members and i had the opportunity to attend the nsb equity Co symposium i also attended the lynching memorial project with miss scott which was very informative but uh, the equity symposium since i'm an engineer i don't really attend things like this it was very eye-opening for me i walked away thinking about the importance of addressing the biases we all have um, it's not easy to say i'm racist or biased but it's important to actually strive to be anti-racist and anti unbiased. Uh, I, and that means identifying areas that are exclusionary um, and working towards implementing systems that are inclusive of everybody. We have a changing demographics happening in BCPS and we need to acknowledge that. Um, and you know, while we can't undo the wrongs of the past, we have to do what's right now, which is why Ms. Scott's initiative that she's been trying for a few, almost a year to start on the board is an equity committee. And I really think we should move forward with that. Uh, it is important. These conversations may be difficult, but they should be have. They should be had by this board, especially. 
we should address these uh, biases, the racist views some of us have, and address it head on. And until we do that, we cannot uh, make any changes. There are school children here that I've heard sad stories just based on the color of their skin. They're immediately asked by people in power, check their residency. That was heartbreaking for me to hear. No student should have to be asked for residency based on the color of their skin. And um, those are systems, those things need to be addressed. And Dr. Williams, I think, is doing a great job. I loved your budget. And I'm, you know, we fully support Dr. Williams, regardless of what people are saying. I'm his biggest supporter. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, with that said, thank you to staff for the budget and for sitting through, through midnight several nights. I know that's a lot of work. I work on budgets, I work on the other end where you guys do, so I, I do know the amount of work that goes into it. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Um, so these are uh, board comments, but also committee comments because we uh, didn't get to those last week. So policy review committee, I'll do that first. Um, our next meeting is March 16th. Um, and the meetings are held in this room uh, beginning at 4.30, and they are open to the public. And the work will continue on our new cell phone policy and on our new uh, document information management policy, as well as other policies that we review um, that uh, Dr. Williams and staff bring to us on a cycle basis or um, if there's some um, need. Um, also, all of the committees it, um, are have their agendas and their minutes online so you can look look at them and they're open to the public and then there are also live streamed and video minutes so anyone can go back and look at the the uh, really a great amount of work that's getting done in those committees um, one of the uh, things that the board is also working on that's not in a live stream because it's meetings we sit in a small room and we talk about things is the board handbook is being revised it hasn't been revised in five years so this board is really looking at every aspect of governance and what can we do to continue to improve how we work, how we work together, how we work with the superintendent, how we work with staff uh, to just improve academic achievement and outcome for all of our children. I was um, pleased to go to the aviation ribbon cutting at Hereford High School. Uh, it's an amazing new program. It's aviation for pilots in the traditional sense, but also for unmanned vehicles. Uh, so I had an exciting time. I did not crash the airplane in the simulator. Uh, nor was I uh, Captain Sully landing it in the ocean in front of me. I just hovered uh, in the right direction, so that was pretty good. The drone, well, it did, if, you know, you can look on Facebook. I might, I might put in LinkedIn what happened to the drone and the whiteboard, but it's okay. They told me it's all fine. Um, the other thing is I spent Friday and Saturday, Newtown High School, really appreciate them. They hosted the County Varsity Wrestling Championships. And uh, so I have a young man that's in that program. But in addition to getting to see him, I also get to see all of the coaches, all of the athletic directors, the administrators that help, the staff that help, and the community that really come together to uh, allow our children to be well-rounded. Uh, Ms. Rowe talked about the amazing uh, performing arts programs that we have, but the sports programs also allow our children to have another avenue to develop character, to team build, to have a stress outlet. So I really just appreciate all the work that's done um, by all the folks that uh, work in that. I also want to say that I was able to go to Annapolis. A number of board members went down for the uh, Maryland Association Boards of Education Legislative Luncheon, uh, which was great. Went down, uh, interacted with board members from around the state. We had delegates and senators coming in talking about um, initiatives and bills that they're working on. Um, I also had the opportunity to go to uh, back to Annapolis. And uh, the Daily Record held a program women who lead and it was a panel about economic justice for women and there were a number of delegates that came and it was wonderful and one of the things that they pointed out is they have a women's legislative caucus that does a lot of events and a lot of activities and one of the things is Wednesday March 4th 
um, they're having a second annual Women's Veterans Day. So it's talking about women and women of color and their military service. So um, that's very exciting, and you can go on the Daily Record and, and look for that. Um, also, when I was in Annapolis, I was pleased to go to the PTA legislative um, reception, and again, to just hear about advocates working on behalf of our children. It's really very encouraging. Um, and that's my report, and we'll move on. Mr. Rashid. Hi. Hi. Um, as most of you know, uh, the top three candidates for the next student member of the board have their uh, speeches out. Uh, you guys can access it online on the BCPS website under student member of the board. Um, they will also be able to have every secondary student watch the videos and submit a single question, uh, which will then be taken with the help of VCPS TV into a question and answer video where we ask the candidates these questions. Uh, this is all going to be online, and this is all new thanks to our IT team and the help of VCPS TV. So I hope every student gets a chance to vote on voting day, <coughs> which is soon. Um, and yeah, for every student, keep inviting me to your schools, keep inviting me to your events, and reach out to me if you need anything. Thank you. Mr. Offerman. I had the pleasure of visiting four schools in recent weeks. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Padonia International Elementary, Cockeysville Middle, Crossroads Center, which I find very interesting, mm -hmm. and uh, Oliver Beach. And uh, again, observing uh, the, heart, the great work that, uh, that, that dedicated professionals are doing, I particularly want to point out that Padonia International Elementary, with 41 languages uh, in, their, uh, in their students, and a high rate of student attendance change because of uh, issues of uh, families moving. Uh, I think you're doing a great job, and uh, I think the whole county should uh, recognize and, uh, and uh, and, and thank that, that, uh, that uh, principal and staff for all they do. Thank you. Ms. Pesture. All right, I'll start real quickly with committees. Um, the government legislative committee, um, I don't know if Mr. Baysmore is still here, but we always want to thank him for the work that he does, and Ms. Eileen Rosenberg, who will always keep us on top of what's coming down the pike in terms of legislation. I think we had a good meeting at um, our last meeting. Uh, I think it was last week. It all runs together. But um, it was really good. I want to thank the members of the committee, Ms. Scott, Ms. Rowe, for uh, the issues that they brought forward. Uh, I tried to uh, go, I did go over the MABE um, uh, legislation and what Mabe's position is on each one, I will put out a printed copy of that soon. Um, I did do last month's uh, printed. Uh, for curriculum, again, thank you to Ms. McComas um, and Ms. Shea and the other members of that department for the wonderful things that you brought touching on all of the pieces about which we were interested, SIRS, um, bridge projects, making sure we understand that they are not just fly-by-night, uh, willy-nilly kinds of activities and what the process um, is for that, and also for PAR, where we had, a, a, I think, a very fruitful and lively conversation, um, and that is the um, peer assistance. Someone uh, earlier talked about um, supporting our teachers and I, I I think it was it's late Cindy <laughs> Sexton okay um pointed that out and I do think what do we have four or so is it four five how many do we have of um 44. we have 44 okay I was just missing a digit work with me um but what they do, oh, it's like 13 per person. Okay, woo, all right, there you go. All right, it came back. But what they do is important, and um, we talked about that, just that collaboration with the school to make sure that our, our first year teachers and our teachers who need more support really feel like they are getting what they need. So thank you uh, for bringing that uh, to the curriculum. 
uh, committee. Uh, just a few things. Um, Newtown, uh, Newtown has already been mentioned, but they also had an avid showcase. And um, I have just sort of beat Miss Scott down to a pulp about um, uh, just how wonderful Newtown's avid program is because it is indeed outstanding. Dr. Williams was there and people from um, national just what they do in terms of uh, bringing back uh, former AVID students and having the tutorials with the students and having a room that, uh, it is just absolutely incredible. And I just want to put that out there for uh, any child. And you can go to AP and GT and all of that, but what AVID gives you as undergirds just being successful beyond high school. It is, it's an, a critical program. It is absolutely wonderful. So bravo to Newtown and their AVID showcase. Uh, I really have to say uh, thank you. All of the people who come up and speak and, and put us in our places, um, I thank you. But I have to thank um, Lori Taylor Mitchell because she gives, she really does give you the beat down beyond coming to board meetings in such a, a ladylike way. Uh, and I want to thank her because it's always easy for us to put out our stuff as it is and say, this is how I do it, period. But she sent out a communication and I sent it back with some more names on it. And she came right back with, okay, well, let's look at the West Side and let's look at these schools, as you see on this paper, that um, are eligible. And Ms. Scott and I feel good because there are schools on there that really do sometimes get ignored, have been ignored, and to see them on there and then for her to say, well, let's just add another board member. Let's have somebody who can speak to this. So thank you, and that's why our outside advocates are so critical. And so for anybody who thinks we're really not listening, wrong. And to that end, I just absolutely, without equivocation, um, have to say that don't ever mistake the fact that people don't always agree and have ugly moments with, with us not working because it's very easy to sit on a board and everyone look at each other and grin, et cetera, et cetera, and nothing gets done. But when you put out different things, that means you are exchanging ideas, and that's what brings about uh, changes. That is equity, when people get to do that and get to disagree. So do not ever make assumptions about any one of us and where we are and how we think. Embrace the fact that we are all working together as a team to make it better. And sometimes it's not pretty, but it's necessary. Pretty doesn't always get the results that we want. We are talking about lives, and that's important. And I'm going to just round that off and just say this. In case some of you don't know, at one point I was in law enforcement and someone said, and had a big weapon, and someone said to me, how is it different in terms of education and being an agent? And my answer was then and it is now. Both are a matter of life and death. And that's a reality. So don't get caught up in hype and other people's hysteria. Look at what we do, not what other people say we are supposed to be about or do. Congratulations to the Ferdinand Virtudes at, at um, Pikesville High School, who is a part of the um, Jack Kent Cook Scholarship Program, which is very special, very prestigious. Um, I also attended Campfield African American Read-In and had to go home and take a nap. Um, <laughs> they wore me out. My little girl said, can you read that story again? OK, because I had to sing and dance with them. I said, absolutely not. You hate me, don't you? And so I'd take a nap. Tavon um, Mason, uh, who is at Franklin Middle School, who's doing a yeoman's job there, 
trying to be more than just glue. He is he's pulling those young folks together and making young folks make a, a think about the decisions that they make. And he was recognized on Fox 45. And I'm going to mess up his name, but I love him anyway. Um, Dr. Mm-hmm, you. Um, okay, go ahead. Let's say it like a chorus. Okay, there you go. And uh, the other pe two people who are with him, uh, because they will be presenting at the Center for um, the Promotion of Social and Emotional Learning. We heard about that tonight. That's important. That's his skill. Love you. That's a, and we need that. So you, I know that you're all going to come back and share. Remember that on Thursday, Dundalk High School is celebrating Black History. Kwaisi and Fume will be their guest speaker, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you for limiting your comments, Ms. Pesture. <laughs> I limited some Did anyone of actually believe I, that? I would have still been talking. <laughs> Ms. Shay. Oh, see, you know, like Shay. Like I said, thank Shay, you. Shay, I said thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so the, the audit committee uh, met on February 18th and We've already had discussion about the presentation. If it's going to be on board docs, that's fantastic. And I hope that we can bring it and put it on the agenda and have an open discussion about it because it's great information about CEP and, and all the funding associated with the Office of Food and Nutrition Support. Um, that was the main discussion point there. So that's, that's it for the, the committee report. And I'm going to make my comments very brief. Um, I. I just want to wish uh, all our student athletes who are about to embark uh, on the spring season uh, the best of luck and um, and good night. So we have a couple items and uh, they're very quick. But I did also want to point out that the board did have uh, its Board of Education and Area Education Advisory Council meeting. And that's a new thing that this board started with having a separate night set aside uh, to get together with our area advisory councils and their members and to have some really good discussions. So we they uh, posed a lot of questions for us and we're getting those answers back to them. Um, there was also you know concern about uh, facilities. And while there are frustrations and there's um, a lot of needs, I did want to just take a minute and reflect on the progress that has been made. So I joined the board in July of 2015. And around um, 2016, we were talking about the um, need for air conditioning. And so this was a chart that I made and brought to the board, you might remember, um, and talked about the schools and the districts that needed support. We had also uh, put together a spreadsheet that talked about the farms rates in some of our schools. And what you can see is there was definite inequity around the districts of who was receiving facilities funding. And what I really you know, don't want to go into too much detail, but here's the sources on the back for all this color-coded information, is all of these schools are either done, provided with central air conditioning or these last few schools that are going to get temporary air conditioning. We've had se many replacement schools built, additions built. So while there are struggles and frustrations, we are making progress. And this board and the county are dedicated to the 10-year capital plan, and that's going to start underway. So I just ask our communities to stay engaged. We're making progress. Um, we've made a lot, but we're going to make a lot more. So the last uh, point is points of information. The student counts book is now available online. Um, and that talks about all of the enrollment data and our schools. Um, also, there's the financial report for the months ending December 2018. And there's also update on key school legislation. And the absolute last item is announcements. The Board of Education public hearing on the Pleasant Plains Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary. Those recommendations are going to be um, recommendations are Wednesday, February 26, 2020 at 6.30 p.m in the Lock Raven High School Auditorium. Um, all of uh, our community members that come and sign up will be able to speak. 
Our next board meeting is Tuesday, March 10th here at 6.30 p.m. So thank you very much and the meeting is adjourned.